Hey, what's up? Welcome to Movie Dumpster Season 3, Episode 18. Today we're talking about Razorback from 1984, directed by Russell McCauley. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. Hello, hello, I'm Conor McGraw. The jokey is I'm Australian. Welcome to the dumpster. Sir? Um, sir, my name is Beth Winters and I'm from the World Animal League. How do you respond to claims by Australian environmental scientists that the kangaroo is becoming extinct? Wouldn't know. I hunt boars. Boars? Razorbacks. Oh, um, well, uh, boars or, or kangaroos, uh, you, you're a professional hunter, right? I mean, you, you make your living by killing wildlife, correct? If you say so. Oh, um, roughly, how many razorbacks would you kill in a season? There isn't a season for razorbacks, girlie. Then why kill them? You oh, I don't know. There's something about blasting the shit out of a razorback that brightens up my whole day. How long do you think I can keep this up for now? <laughs> yeah, don't worry, man, because uh, the bad the bad Australian accents are fucking coming hard and fast. <laughs> you know me with this shit. Yeah, I, w- I was already thinking about our good friend, uh, where is he? He's around here some- somewhere. Uh, oh, there he is. Ah, oh, crikey! <laughs> oh, st- hey, Steve, how you doing? Oh, it's the movie dumpster, pals. How you doing there, pals? <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, I'm losing the accent already. Couldn't even make it one sentence, but... Uh, Holy shit! I'm just imagining him, like, clutching his temples and screaming in horror this entire film. These blokes are fucking stupid assholes. Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you talking about? I hope Simon Basel doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> He'd probably get a kick out of it. What part of Australia is this? What kind of godless wasteland is this? Honestly, we could have used a little Steve Irwin and Simon Basel in this film. Yeah, seriously. They could have wrapped up this case a lot sooner and a lot less messy. It's true. Yeah, like, I, so, hello, Simon, if you're listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> he handled those uh, fucking lizards like far more handedly than anybody handles this one animal in this movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, and I can honestly see fucking Irwin, you know, basically like uh, Legolas coming off that fucking elephant, flipping through the air, landing on the back of this razor hog and just fucking taking it out, dog tying it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, all in a day's work. <laughs> he would take it alive, too. Like, he'd just jump on it and, like, grab it by the tusk and be like, come on, you, come on, big lady, come on. Woo-wee! <laughs> Who grabbed this, Sheila, right by the gonads? <laughs> <laughs> the cameraman's with him. He's like, no, you're sitting in gravity. You can take the animal to the ground faster. Oh, man, he starts talking about it like, now here we have a beautiful Razorback. The biggest one I've ever seen. He's a monster. So we're here with our first portion helping, serving yeah. of our barbecue. Oh, yeah, it started. For the month of August. You uh, you might have heard about it from, uh, <laughs> how you doing? there, folks. Oh, Gramps was fucking cooking it up, man. He was flipping those burgers. I just keep on flipping and flipping <laughs> and flipping. He's so dry, I think he would just burst into flames if he got too close to a grill, though. Like, you think he would just combust? <laughs> oh, he did pretty well. He was fine. He had his uh, his movie dumpster uh, barbecue apron on. He was using the the uh, Granny Van Dam special barbecue sauce and his uh, special uh Dumpster barbecue rub? Mmm. Yeah. It smells delicious. Does the GVD sauce taste like you've been touched inappropriately? Well, you know, we don't know the special ingredient. She specifically yes. asks us not to give that away, so we're not sure. Don't ask her about it, that's for sure. You don't want to know. She pumps the rifle real fast. <laughs> Don't fucking ask me ever again. You see her squeezing that fucking Lubden starfish into a fucking bowl? Yeah, yeah. That's what you're getting. Shamrock shake, right. You know, <laughs> bringing it back to that. It gives it a little tang. It sure does. Southwestern sauce. Mm-hmm. Mm. So during our barbecue month this month, uh, we were running a contest. Um, and if you saw that video with Gramps, you'll know that you can enter by shooting us a direct message on any of the social media platforms and or shooting us a direct email at moviedumpsterpodcast at gmail.com. All you have to do to enter is write barbecue giveaway. Literally all you have to do. We're going to choose four winners at random, one each uh, for each episode that we put out. And yeah, you can get yourself a fucking, you're going to get yourself a uh, a barbecue barbecue apron uh, emblazoned with our, with our awesome logo by Dave DeForn. Yes. You're going to get a, a dumpster barbecue rub. Rub you can rub it on your meats, your fish, your your uh, 
your vegetables, wherever the, whatever the fuck you want to grill. Your Bo Derek leg, you know, if you got one of those lying around. Cook it up right next to the corn on the cob, right there on the grill. Yep. And you're going to get a, uh, or you're going to get two more things, excuse me. You're going to get a, a bottle of Granny Van Dam special sauce that's all organic and all natural, non-GMO, vegan, no milk, all that good stuff. You know, Granny goes hard, but she eats clean. She eats clean. She's 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 a smart lady. How do you think she stayed alive all this time? I was say she hasn't lived for centuries for no reason. Like. <laughs> Charnetsky brings that chunky chicken in, and she tells him to get that shit the fuck away from her. <laughs> and then as a bonus, too, you're going to get a movie dumpster uh, barbecue koozie. Or cozy, however the fuck you say that. Koozie. Koozie. I call it koozie. That's what I've been calling it for 32 years, so sure. Yeah, me too. You can be like your your drunk uncle at your barbecue with a fucking barbecue goo- koozie. Drunkle? Drunkle Pinhead? Yeah. yeah you, could be, you could be like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio at the end of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, man, there you go. Out in the pool listening to some jams while a murder goes on inside your house. <laughs> All with a barbecue koozie to boot. Get the flamethrower. <laughs> With the apron on, yeah, I could see it. I'd like to see that. So yeah, you could just send us a direct message, barbecue giveaway, and literally anywhere you can message us, and you will be entered to win. And if you want to go the extra mile, reshare anything about the barbecue, whether it be an episode or the promotional video itself, and hashtag barbecue giveaway, and you'll be entered again. How's that sound? Sounds pretty good to me. God, I'm, you're just making me fucking hungry now. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, side note, we've been super, super busy. <laughs> Yeah, this whole Gramps thing kind of came together super fucking fast. It was uh, a little peek behind the curtain. It was just something that we were throwing around just offhandedly one day, and we're like, you know what, let's do this. Why not? What's stopping us? We had one day to shoot it, really, so... The makeup took a long time, and you know it came out great. So yes, <laughs> so so we're we're we were happy we could do that for you. And then you know we'll be doing something similar like we did last year for Trick or Trash. But yep. we wanted to get a new event up, which was obviously uh, the barbecue for this month. So uh, we hope you guys enjoy it. We got some good shit coming up. Hey, and you might have even seen Gramps uh, introduce the movie we're about to talk about. Yeah, you sure did. So yeah, giant pigs. <laughs> giant pigs. <laughs> Connor, you have some stories about some giant pigs? I do. First, before I get to giant pigs, I'm going to get to uh, radioactive pigs. Oh, or razorbacks? Boars? They're all the same. So these are, they're regular sized pigs, but uh, basically in the 30, 40 years since Chernobyl, there have been boars wandering the, the lands around uh, Chernobyl, and they're... One in three of them are radioactive. Huh. Well, I think everything around Chernobyl is radioactive, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's it has increased the size of the wolves over there. I think there have been stories about like radioactive wolves that are just a little bit bigger than they should be. Oh, like dire wolves? Oh, uh-oh. Okay, Bethesda. <laughs> When are we going to get the Russia Fallout game? Like- well, here's... A, okay, you know what's funny about that? They just announced Stalker 2, Shadow... And the Stalker games are games set in and around Chernobyl. And, oh, okay. Uh, you take the role of a stalker, which basically means you go into this affected area... And your job is to uh, confront uh, any of these monsters you find in there or collect anomalies and you bring them back and sell them. They're kind of like scrappers for the Chernobyl area. I played the first one for PC. But yeah, that's going on Chernobyl, but in other parts of the world. And uh, I have a list of 10 of them. I'm not going to read all of them off. But um, the smallest one on this list is 410 pounds killed in uh, North Carolina. Um, Let's go down a little bit. 400, 500 pounds, and I'm going to get to the really, really big guys here. So, uh, in Turkey, there was one killed at 781 pounds. Holy shit. Are you going to talk about Hogzilla? I'm sorry. Did I jump the gun? (laughs) Did I jump the proverbial Razorback? I think he's probably on this list somewhere. Um, In Hong Kong, there is one still at large that weighs 600 pounds. Still at large? What is it? Like, it's got wanted posters out for it? There is a video. The thumbnail of this video is a boar standing on its hind legs eating from a fucking dumpster, which is so appropriate for this episode. It's not even fun. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Um, In Texas, a 790-pound hog was taken alive. The original Hogzilla is 800 pounds. He is number eight on this list. Oh, really? So there's other... Dude, that was a big fucking pig. It's a giant fucking pig. Have you guys seen pictures of that thing? Oh, yeah. I'm looking right at it. It's fucking huge. There's There's a guy standing next to it, and he only comes up to about its chest. Oh, well, get ready for those Instagram posts, because we're going to be fucking posting some pigs. Yeah, so... And now number nine was apparently the new Hogzilla before number 10. 1,100 pounds taken in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Oh, my God. The fucking reigning champ right now? Nope. Number 10. (laughs) Oh, my God. 
God. This one is, the validity of this one is questioned. Uh, a Russian hog supposedly tipped the scales at 1,179 pounds. So really, 80 pounds separates these two giant pigs at the end of this list. I was going to say, you think Putin's got his thumb on the uh, scale for that one? <laughs> See, we grow big as pig. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we found a pig that was 1,100 pounds. Well, trust us. We're reputable. Are you telling me his that Vladimir Putin's thumb can exert 80 pounds of pressure? Maybe. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't, you know, he says it does. That's all that matters. You know, that's what they write down, whatever he tells them. I read the scale. It says, it says plus 80 pounds. His biggest pig. If you do not say this pig is the largest, I will murder you with my right thumb. <laughs> and usually I don't even warn you, so. I can push your eyeball through your skull with just my, with my, just my thumb. <laughs> Which is apparently 80 pounds. Yeah. Well, you know. 80 pounds. I can apply 80 pounds pounds of pressure through your small human skull. Is that like the Russian death thumb? Like, what, what is that? <laughs> is that like the five-finger death punch? I mean, if you're in a room with Vladimir Putin and you're not his ally, I think you're already pretty fucked. Yeah. I am only man in existence who knows this technique. <laughs> I killed rest. He has five-finger death punch. I have one thumb death touch. <laughs> death touch. It's my dim muck. So... Let's talk about the director a little bit. Russell McCulley. Um, I had to look up how to pronounce this guy's name because I was like, is it McCulley? I, they probably say it some like similarly, but it's like a Gaelic last name. McCulley is how the, is how you. It, it sure fucking is. Yeah, it's how you say it. <laughs> but this guy started directing with music videos. His first music video was uh, an ACDC music video. Which one? A Baby Please Don't Go. Okay, not familiar with that one. Can't say I'm a big ACDC head, though, so continue. Which is crazy to me, because MTV started with the Buggles' Video Killed the Radio Star. That was the first music video, like the big-time music video that like premiered on television, and he fucking directed that. Really? So that's pretty huge. Yeah. You, you know that fucking song, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that song is on regular rotation on my phone. He goes on to do videos for uh, Human League, uh, Paul McCartney's Wonderful Christmas Time. Oh, God, a.k.a. the worst Christmas song ever. I love that song, dude. Worst five, in my opinion. Every year when it comes on, uh, my fiance Julie and I, we just sing Paul McCartney for all of the <laughs> lyrics. Okay, I like that. It's fine, but it's it's inferior to Chris's rappings by the waitresses, okay? Uh that, that's the worst ever for me personally. <gasps> no, no, dude. It goes it goes Last Christmas by Wham. Then it goes Christmas wrappings by the waitresses. Can we not talk about Christmas right now? What, what, what did I start? <laughs> okay, we're going to rank the fuck we're going to rank Christmas songs come for trashing it through the snow. Okay. Well, lay lay that nightmare before me in December. <laughs> Not in August. Well, I'm going to bring you some weird ones that month then. <laughs> it's all right. Fucking Sean's favorite song is Christmas Shoes, probably. <laughs> Have you ever seen the Hallmark movie, though? Uh, no. And I don't want to. Me, me either. I'm good. Thanks. I don't need that kind of sadness in my life. I'm going to therapy as it is. <laughs> We're never doing another sad movie for Christmas again. <laughs> fuck that. Uh, yeah, it's definitely not on the slate for sure. Yeah, thanks, Prancer. Yeah, fuck you. So he also does Turning Japanese for the Vapors. Did he do anything for Duran Duran? He does. He he does Rod Stewart, Elton John, Duran Duran, The Tubes, The Rolling Stones, Fleetwood Mac, Billy Joel, Super Tramp, and Queen. Wow. Because at one point, Duran Duran comes on the radio, and I'm like... I wonder why that specifically was what came on. Yeah, he did a bunch uh, for them, specifically uh, Rio and uh, Hungry Like the Wolf. Okay, yeah. Now, I mean, my, a couple of my favorite songs uh, from Duran Duran. Sure, yeah. Oh, I'm looking at his list for music, video, music videos right now. He did this music video with my favorite Rod Stewart song. Which is? Young Turks. Oh, okay. So he makes all of these music videos, and then he does this film, Razorback. Then he does more music videos, and then he does fucking Highlander. That caught me really off guard just now <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh he did fucking highlander he that's my one of my favorite movies mother of god <laughs> oh wait sorry that was the orca excuse me wait, imagine richard harris as christopher lambert <laughs> After he ascended, he comes down just, like, floating in because he doesn't want to break his ankles. He's just drunk. Yeah. Swinging his sword around. I've got a cadaver. Oh, my God, Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> and he has to fight fucking Sean Connery. Oh, man. Sign me up. It's weird because when I was growing up, Highlander was, like, the shit. Yeah, it's great. It's still great. I remember watching the TV show semi-regularly growing up. I remember Highlander Endgame being kind of a thing, and the fact that, like, one, I was watching wrestling at the time, and one of the biggest marketing hooks was, like, it features Edge for probably, like, ten seconds. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then, like, after Highlander Endgame, um, that whole series just kind of 
nobody talks about it anymore. Yeah, because uh, what the third one like introduced like aliens or some shit. Oh god. Endgame was like aliens or whatever. I can't remember that one too well. I know. I just know Endgame had uh, the McClouds fight. It was it was you know uh, Connor McCloud and whoever the fuck uh, was on the TV show fighting. Right, right, right. Side note: This guy also directed Highlander too. Well, not side note. That was the next thing I was gonna get to. Yeah. <laughs> So he did the first two, so I guess he did, again, I didn't see the second one, but I'm assuming the other good one. Oh yeah, he did the quickening as well. Then he does more music videos, and then he does The Shadow. Oh my god. I think that's one of Connor's favorite movies, right? No, I've never seen it. I just, I don't want to. Oh, uh, we got a bald one kicking around in there. Maybe we should fucking, <laughs> we got, I gotta watch that. Arlen has seen it and has, I don't think he's ever had a good thing to say about it. Oh boy. And in fact, every time it comes up, I think I can feel like, like his hairline receding and like he just hurts on the inside somewhere. I mean, if there's a good conversation to be had about it, I don't mind doing it on the show, but I... You know, we've been kind of steering away from doing sh- movies that suck, and that's kind of never really been the goal anyway, but, like, I don't want to, again, like, I don't want to sit there and, I mean, it's funny that there's a bald one in it, but, like, I don't know if it's good enough to watch. Sure. The conversation to be had about it is is the fact that other people in the time period tried doing Batman, and none of them ever landed as hard. Like, you know, you have Dark Man in the Shadow, and, I, and maybe one or two others, but, like, Dark Man's better, but also it's completely off its fucking it's it's off its rocker. Oh, Dark Man is so good though. And the Shadow, I think, is based on an old property, but it's again you're trying to capture the same kind of attitude and tone. And I think that's probably what the conversation would be. Sure. Which I would love to have because people ripping off Batman is kind of one of my hobbies. Isn't it even like proto like Sin City? Yeah. Well, I mean, the 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 Spirit is the other movie that came out in like 2009, which was trying to. Oh, the Spirit. Excuse me. That's what it was. It, that was Frank Miller's directorial debut and it was all the evidence anyone ever needed that he should never make a movie ever again yeah i just i just confused those two so yeah well they, it's it's a guy you know you know in a fucking a fedora and and a flowy coat <laughs> but one is arguably worse than the other one and it's the spirit oh yeah i i would i probably bank on it <laughs> the spirit is so fucking bad he's also directed um a couple of tales from the crypt episodes um silent trigger with dolph lundgren the resurrected with christopher lambert the hunger the series which I've never seen. He's directed some episodes of Queer as Folk. He fucking directed Resident Evil Extinction? What? Yeah, the third one. Yeah. Was that like the only one Paul S. Anderson didn't direct? I guess. I thought Paul did them all. No, you know, and that's... Here's the weird thing. That's one of the worst ones, too. Is it really? Yeah, I... I mean, personally, I fucking detest that movie i've seen the first and second one and that is all i've seen of the resident evil franchise yeah same a a quick resident evil rant uh resident evil afterlife is probably the best movie in that series that's not the first one but uh yeah everything else in that series is shit they just get progressively worse after that but extinction is fucking bad it's really fucking bad Uh, it sounds like shit isn't that the one where they start doing like resident evil 5 shit no resident evil extinction is like first of all like between the first and third movies somehow the entire world gets turned into a mad Max desert and then by the next movie it's all fine <laughs> right but don't they introduce like uh no it's i think four so resident evil afterlife and then resident evil whatever the fuck happens after that one is when um they start like just kind of haphazardly introducing and like ripping off uh not just characters and enemies but um there's a sequence i think it's either in afterlife or the one after that where they stole Shot for shot, move for move, line for line, the fight scene between Wesker, Chris, and Sheva, and just slapped it into the movie. Well, they didn't steal it. They just literally plopped it in. They were like, okay, we're going to take this from the Vidya game. It's ripped wholesale to the point where you're like, you didn't try anything differently. <laughs> like you, st- you stole whole shots, you stole lines. Like That whole fucking series didn't try at all. Like, why wouldn't you just make the fuck... Like... I, I still will never get over it because, like, I remember being so disappointed when I went to go see the first film and I was like, fuck this shit. I don't need it. The way you talk about it, it's almost as if the Resident Evil series of movies has their own fucking crazy MDU, uh, you know, spider web, you know, connecting things together that that shouldn't be connected. Yeah, I think you're right that, like, <laughs> the Resident Evil movie series is the fucking MDU of Resident Evil? The RDU? <laughs> the RDU. <laughs> The R-E-D-U. Yeah, well, there you go. The fifth or sixth movie introduces Leon, Ada, reintroduces Jill, and Barry Burton. Barry is killed before the end of the movie. And then by this next movie, every one of those video game characters I said who were still around are all just 
just murdered off screen and never mentioned again. Oh my god, that sounds like dog shit. And then we roll right along to fucking Scorpion King 2. Oh, oh no. Yeah, you know what? I don't actually hate the Scorpion King. I've been kind of petitioning to do it on this show the last couple of years it just doesn't make it hasn't made sense yet no i haven't seen it since theaters but like when i saw that in the theaters i remember liking it just because one it was like the like the i think probably the height of my wrestling fandom so i was seeing like the rock in a, his own movie well well you know michael clark duncan being besides him helps yeah yeah and uh and he wasn't a giant like <laughs> to this day <laughs> one of the worst cgi monstrosities to ever grace the big screen oh yeah brendan fraser beat the scorpion king yeah <laughs> any motep at the same time uh yeah 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 but in like in the second one it's not even the rock is it it's like some other dude yeah i don't even know if it's the same character I'm, i really don't even know to be honest beats me i have no idea and i think they made like three or four of these fucking movies he gets replaced by like one of those like those uh like hollywood handyman martial arts guys i can't remember any of their names but like they're always casper van dean Mario Van Peebles? No, like what, like l- like the legit martial arts experts, like like a Michael Clark Duncan level. Gotcha. I didn't know Michael Clark Duncan was a kung fu master. Michael Clark Duncan is a legit martial arts guy. Oh, or a martial arts master, excuse me. Yeah, he's actually he's a utility guy for um for action movies and stuff like that because really? I think he helps he helps choreograph and stuff like that. Like that's why he was pegged for that Mortal Kombat reboot uh, reboot the Rebirth thing where he was gonna play Jax because he's a legit martial artist. He could be a good old Jax. I could see it. And he popped up in the last few seasons of Arrow, and he was also in the first few seasons, he was Bronze Tiger, and it's because he has a martial arts background. Huh. Oh, that's pretty sweet. So he does he does get to flex that and be character specific. Yeah. Except in Spawn, it's like, hey, you can be a martial arts expert for like two scenes, and then we're going to cover you in bullshit for the, <laughs> the next 90 minutes. Wait a second. You mean Michael Jai White? Oh, did I say Mike Clark Duncan? It's Michael Jai White. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like, I'm like, I didn't know Michael Clark Duncan was a fucking... Wow, fuck me. Imagine the visual running through Joe and myself's head. Yeah, I was like, he's a martial artist? Man, Michael Clark Duncan being a a legit martial artist is a fantastic visual now that I say it. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, wow, I never knew that. Like, he did stuff like the Green Mile, and I just, I just had no idea. I I legit am picturing him as Jax, old Jax now, and I could see it. No, no, because I was like, yeah, that would be pretty sick. Like, Farmer Jax telling fucking his daughter that he that she shouldn't fight in fucking Outworld. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've had one cup of coffee and no breakfast yet, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> No problem. Uh, Michael, just side note, like, Michael Jai White was... At a um, award ceremony for martial arts that I went to, and I was like, and I was thinking about him, and I was like, oh yeah, I know Michael Jai White, fucking Michael Clark Duncan, huh? That's pretty interesting. God, can you imagine him like doing a roundhouse kick to somebody, his giant self? <laughs> oh my goodness! Runs in from off screen, jumping, fucking kick to the mouth, like just decapitates the person. My God, like ima- like Ben Affleck's Daredevil would have no fucking chance against him if that was the case. Oh yeah, <laughs> dude, he would be a good uh, what should we call it? Who's the fucking Time Guardian guy made of sand in the in the new Mortal Kombat? Oh. <laughs> Garrus. Yeah, Garrus, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's dream casting that I'll never get. Yeah. No, because, you know, they're going to reboot it again with 12. Yeah, they will. You know what? Because he's gone and uh, and in the MDU, we like to just kind of make shit up. You know what? Michael Clark Duncan is a martial arts expert going forward, okay? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> well, he's the fuck. He's Garrus now. He's unstoppable and he's made of sand. Yeah, he's Garrus. He's, he lives on in our universe as a martial arts expert who, you, who one does not fuck with. Who cannot be killed. You know the lore you've just concocted? He's a fucking... <laughs> uh, a basically... A a dude that's like part cybernetic that has sand for blood that can recreate <laughs> like basically die and come back to life instantaneously oh man he's but he unfortunately he's a servant of hurt uh oh well chronica sucks so yeah i'd rather him just move over to hurt yeah sure yeah he would switch allegiances immediately could you imagine fucking hurt with the crown on <laughs> just like spinning his hands around the fucking orb of time shang sung is like oh this is way worse than me like we have a big problem in our hands <laughs> We're going to have to Photoshop that for the people at home that have no idea what we're talking about right now. Oh, yeah. Well, just to wrap that up real quick, he did Lizzie Lizzie Borden series, the Teen Wolf series, and 13 Reasons. Oh, Arlen. Teen Wolf. (laughs) You fucking could keep that shit. There's only two Teen Wolves. There's Michael J. Fox and fucking that guy from Arrested Development. Sure. Arlen will fight you on that. I hope you know. Fuck that show. (laughs) I'll fight him. Stupid. Since we did just invoke his name, uh, I do have a Patreon question involving... The Dear Doctor. Oh, okay, yeah. Let's get to those Patreon questions. Uh, I, I put this up a little late, uh, just with all the other video stuff going on. We also, at the time of this recording, um, we had just started promoting Orca. And uh, if you haven't listened to that yet, go back and listen to that. And check out that video we did with C.B. Smith 
over on his YouTube channel, over on Taking a Page. Joe did an awesome graphic for it, and Smith got the episode all put together, and uh, I think it came out amazing. Yeah, Smith did a really good job putting everything together. Speaking of Arlen in this, he made a good point. He, he's... And that's why I put that Instagram post up. He's like, you're just Jeff from the Craig Ferguson show at this point. Like, that's all you are. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I thought you were like Paul Lynn from fucking Hollywood Squares. Or something along those lines, yeah. From Freaked. I'm now, ba- I'm, I'm, I like the fact that I'm a voice actor now. <laughs> yeah, because of course Connor appearing in his skeletal form uh, in the video. Check it the fuck out. Oh yeah. There'll be more Connor in the future. <laughs> Absolutely. He was even in that Gramps video. And he sure was. Our patron Dustin asks us, Tornado Tag Match. John Hurt, Daniel Baldwin, and GVD approach the each of you and demand there be sacrifice. Who would each of you pick to be your team of three to try and take down the evils of the MDU? Oh, I love this question. Like, within the MDU? Sure. Yeah. Because my initial thought was if it was me, Joe, and Connor, I definitely want to fight Baldwin, just putting that out there. <laughs> See, so yeah, yeah, here's the thing. I would go to hit GVD, and, like, the universe would just become undone. It would be like a fucking, like, kung fu hustle situation where you're, like, fighting that landlady. Not even, dude. It'd become a it'd become a pumpkin head situation. Like, he hits GVD, and then, like, his nose starts to bleed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm fighting my own creation. Like, it would be like a continuity punch. Like, we'd hit each other. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> we hit each other, and, like, th- everything would just come undone. Like, it would just, like, <laughs> it's like the end of, uh, the end of Rejected for, uh, what, what's his face david hertzfeld that animator gvd's your pumpkin head dude god damn you <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> she slashes me she both she gets hurt too <laughs> you end up like lighting her on fire and then you burn and it's a whole thing you know what i think i have three dobby because we can just bring him back <laughs> <laughs> dobby and he'd just be a good distraction and the other two i would go with is uh christian bale and Al- alfonso ribeiro because of the two sh- actually no i'm changing my question i'm changing my answer forget dobby uh terry o'quinn with his fucking metal arm <laughs> Alphonse and Gee, Christian Bale. You have like ten people on your team. No, I changed it. It's Do- I forget forget Dobby. It's Terry O'Quinn. <laughs> Dobby wouldn't even have been half a person. Let's be honest. Yeah. So you have Alfonso Ribeiro and the white realtor. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, kinda. And Christian Bale. And Christian Bale. Well, you know, Christian Bale with the Gunkata. Well, okay, so you have Captain America, Falcon, and fucking Winter Soldier on your team? Avengers, you're just missing the, uh, you know, the Iron Man of the group, you know, Al Pacino, who has yet to make an appearance on this show, but clearly the, uh, the leader of the MDU Avengers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was on here once, but he was talking to Robert Downey. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. He made a cameo. He hasn't appeared in a film, though. Yeah, he was in a quick cameo, yeah. God, I forgot about that. <laughs> that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when we put on the play of Heat? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> MDU classic. Got to put that on the Chronicle. Uh, um, I would probably... I can choose three or two or three. Three. Um, well, you want to have, you know... Who, what three of yours are going to go against GVD, John Hurt, and, and Daniel Baldwin? Okay, here we go. I'm with Sean because I would contend with... Daniel Baldwin. Yeah, I think he's the one we actually have a shot against. The other two were kind of fucked. Yeah, like if I bring booze and like a bag of McDonald's, like I can distract him long enough to like stab him in the back of the head or something. Sure. Yeah. Well, this, this tornado tag rule, so you got to pin him. Oh, I do. Yeah. Well, when he's he'll he'll fucking pass out from the tequila, and then I'll just fucking <laughs> pin his ass. The stage lights will dehydrate him. <laughs> That man's got the tequila. Look out. <laughs> oh, no, man. He's got the tequila. Let's go. Let pins him for the win. One, two, three. Baldwin's mouth is just watering the second he sees it come out. He's like wiping fucking drool off his lips. Oh, my goodness. Um, And then I'd probably... <sighs> Who would fight Hurt? Um, I would say maybe Norm. Norm's like impervious <laughs> to shit. Which one? A gnome named Norm. No, not Norm from Cheers. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> George Went would walk in there and get knocked out in like one second. He, he'd show up, he'd be like, oh, I brought the Chinese food in a six-pack of Bud Dry. Uh, what's going on? Oh, you mean you want me to fight them? Oh, shit. <laughs> F- uh, fuck, I was. I came over to watch the game. What, what are you talking about? He'd get his clock cleaned in about four seconds flat. Yeah, but, you know, normal fucking grab John Hurt by the dick and fucking bite his leg or something, and then I can hit him with something. Like a steel chair? Yeah. Knock him out, pin him? Maybe. That could work. For GVD, probably Allie Oates. Ooh. She would come in with her fucking clothes monster? <laughs> her fucking clothes megazord? And just fucking take out GVD. She's Ragman. She's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's his mom, Rag, Ragman's mom. Yeah. 
shows up with her magical cloak. She's like, I got the. She's like, this is weed from 10,000 cursed laundry, you know, whatever. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Rag, Ragman from DC or Ragman from Trick or Treat? Oh, Ragman from DC. Oh, I was, I'm thinking my boy Ragman from Trick or Treat. Oh, take your pick. Oh, fuck no. Ragman from DC is like, he's like, he has actual magic. So. <laughs> yeah, but he beat Sammy Kerr. Oh, wait a second. I want Sammy Kerr on my team. Holy shit. I forgot all about him. Yeah, Sammy Kerr v. John Hurt. I think I think that works. Yeah, John Hurt would be in a uh, a spot of trouble. I think going against Sammy Kerr. Sa- Sammy Kerr is like the he's like the scorpion is like the wild card. You're like not really sure what side he's on until he like steps up. He's like, yeah. <laughs> dude, you know what he could do? Honestly, that's a good pick, Joe, because he could just you know activate his fucking whatever powers and just control Baby, make it blip out of time. Oh yeah, he could. He could fucking be like go into Baby and then and just fucking shock the shit out of Hurt or something. Release a demon inside of it. I want this in some kind of readable form. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, we're cooking something up. Okay, so my answer. So the first one, uh, I don't even know if I have to name three after I name this person. Uh, Uwe Boll. <laughs> uh, just get him on my team. Oh, my God. You want to talk about OP? He, he would love to beat the shit out of anybody, really. Yeah. Um, and since it is Tornado Tag, we have to keep that in, in consideration. There's going to be tables. There's going to be chairs uh, involved in some capacity. Maybe even a... Uh, a burning uh, bar, you know, barbed wire bat. You know, we don't, we don't know. These people are crazy that are involved in this three-way uh, tornado tag match. Oh yeah, man. So I think, I think just because he just came up earlier in the episode and he's on my mind, Steve Irwin would be one of my choices. <laughs> You know, you know, he goes under the ring to find weapons, and you just like hear the commentary like, "Oh golly, look at this! Oh man, look, oh this will be great!" He comes out with like a fucking taser. He's like, "I'll take this, get him right in the chest, and cover them for a pin." I'm gonna tag him. Runs in, gets John Hurt right in the fucking peacemaker. <laughs> and then all three of the ba- all three of the heels are like, "Do you want to be seen on TV like punching Steve Irwin? Like, do you?" Do- <laughs> oh, that- <laughs> Meanwhile, Uwe Boll is, like, standing there, like... like Hitting everybody? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just going in, haymaker after haymaker. <laughs> and, uh, number three... Huh. Any MDU character. Oh, man. This can't actually be defeated, so I think it's kind of a cheating answer, but I'm gonna say it regardless. The Ghost Shark. Oh. <laughs> but what are you gonna do against that? I don't know. It's just it's just Uwe and the Ghost Shark at the end of the day. Right, you gotta, you gotta find its original body. Mm-hmm. It's in some fucking cave next by, next to uh, Richard Mole's lighthouse in, in the middle of Florida. <laughs> like, we're, we don't know where this match is taking place. It probably is taking place in Florida with COVID. Probably. Going on and everything. So maybe you got a chance to find it in time before the match is over. But at that point, you've probably been bitten in half. You know, I, I could see the ghost shark grabbing uh, Daniel Baldwin, taking it in the air, and just, you know, off a fucking ladder through a table. Like, he's done. Yeah, man, comes out of that fucking whiskey bottle because he's got liquid in there. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Comes out of the tequila. Tequila shark, yeah. And, you know, Bal- Baldwin's body is just ripped apart across the ring. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's my team. Ghost shark, uh, Uwe Boll, and uh, Steve Irwin. You could even have Steve Irwin riding the ghost shark, let's be honest. Oh, yeah. I want an assist trophy, though. (laughs) I throw, like, a pokeball, and the fucking Razorback comes out and just runs somebody down. There you go. Goes through the whole arena. And and then, like, even though there's no fire damage, the building explodes. Yep. He knocks over a fucking lantern, and it just lights on fire, burns it to the ground. (laughs) Blows up a gasoline factory. Yeah, yeah, I could see it. Uwe is just still punching that fucking ghost shark. Passes uh, C.B. Smith knocking out a blue whale. Yeah, I could see it. (laughs) Sign me up. I want all of that. But uh, I think we all answered that. Yeah. Unless you have, either of you have something else to add. What you got, Celebrity Deathmatch? Nothing on us. Oh, man. I mean, honestly, you could have, you know, the Wizards collectively could be the referees. You just have them all over the ring. This is Tornado Tag Rules. They're impartial in this particular contest. Yeah. Oh, you know, I, well, you know, you know, Uwe went in there with a with a, with a strong right hook, and that ghost shark just took him out. I don't, I don't know. I... You just have Haggerty and Gunner on commentary. That would be the most low-energy match of all time. And Charnetsky. <laughs> Well, we're out. They're they're in the ring and they're fighting each other. And Charnetsky's just sitting there like, oh god damn it! He's like, I, you know, I could be at home right now, you fuckers. Instead, I'm watching <laughs> this shit. Give him the skull cracker. Oh no, G- GVD just read the words to Terry O'Quinn. He's been activated. <laughs> <laughs> I just picture, like, you know, like, sometimes... I mean, I haven't watched wrestling in years, but they would show the commentary uh, people, and they'd always make a point to show, like, the Coca-Cola products on the desk. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, so, Michael Kane would never drink his, but King would be constantly downing his drink. I could see Charnitsky is just, like, blowing through, like, chunky chicken and fucking Cokes, and they're, like, all over, like, in piles <laughs> on the announce desk. There's just a big, giant bottle of Bushmills. Yeah, there was a period of time where they were promoting Skittles, and, like, every time they would cut back to the fucking commentary team, Jim Ross was, like, losing his mind over skill. He's like, fruity, 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 fruity. Fresh and duty, snickeroonie. 
<laughs> Snickeroonie. Chunkaroonie. So, so we, we uh, as Joe Apley put it, uh, charge out of this arena into the movie, I guess, properly. Yeah, let's dog it. Um, some some good old exploitation we're going to be talking about here because... Oh, yeah. Before we get into the movie movie, I just want to start talking to some more uh, BTS shit. It's written by Everett DeRoche, um, who wrote Patrick, which is another great uh, exploitation film, uh, Long Weekend, Road Games, Link... Which is fucking amazing. It's a, it's like a, it's like a killer. Not a well. I don't want to say killer monkey movie or killer gorilla movie or killer primate movie, but it is sort of uh, the quest. Oh, the no. only other fucking movie that I've seen like Elliot from from E. T. in, and then he wrote the remake of Long Weekend in two thousand eight, which I guess was the year for remakes because what do we get? Wasn't the Stepfather come out the same fucking year? Oh yeah, I think that that sounds right. Oh nine. Oh nine. Well, same shit. Yeah, same ballpark. We got Brian Cox. On effect, we got Brian Cox, Alan Maxwell, Chris Murray, and Bob McCarran on FX. And collectively, these guys have done Beyond Thunderdome, The Road Warrior, Howling 3, uh, Street Fighter, Operation Dumbo Drop, Island Dr. Moreau, The Matrix, Pitch Black, Mission Impossible 2, Scooby Doo, uh, Rogue, that uh, Greg McLean movie with the giant crocodile. Ah, Worthington. Yeah. Uh, probably his best work. I would say so. <laughs> uh, the Wol- the Wolverine, San Andreas, uh, Thor Ragnarok. Whoa! Aquaman. Alan Maxwell specifically worked on uh, The Punisher. Dead End Drive-In, ni- the 90s Ultraman series. Chris Murray worked on the first Mad Max film. BMX Bandits, Singapore Sling, The Power Rangers movie, Farscape. And Bob McCarran... Um, created the titular Razorback, and he worked on uh, Road Warrior and Dark Age, which is a great Oz, uh, Aussie um, crocodile flick from the 80s. And he also worked on Body Melt and Brain Dead, a.k.a. Dead Alive. Then scooting on down the road, uh, we got a score by Iva Davies, and he's the founder of the, and the lead singer of Ice House, and he he's actually done the score to Master and Commander, <laughs> and he has songs... On the Space Jam soundtrack? What? Yeah, and Young Einstein with Yahoo Serious. Uh, uh, that's a name I haven't heard in a very long time. Uh, oh, man. Master and Commander is like one of my dad's favorite films. Is it? Re- I think you mentioned that before. Yeah, my dad loves... B- well, Das Boot is his favorite movie. Right, with Yagner uh, Prash now, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, a notable uh, one, the fact that all three of these guys worked on three Mad Max movies is not surprising in the fucking slightest after watching this movie. Oh, no. <laughs> We're going to get into it, but yeah, it doesn't surprise me either. Two, I just want to make a note of it as the big DC guy. Um, the Knowing they worked on the effects for Aquaman, that movie, like Aquaman or not, that movie is fucking gorgeous. And a lot yeah. of the effects are fan-fucking-tastic. So, yeah. Speaking of Mad Max, uh, Dean Semler is on cinematography in this film, and he shot The Road Warrior. Oh. Again, not surprising at all. No! <laughs> I guess be, right before we get into this, do you guys know what cut you watched? Whatever YouTube had, because I rented it on YouTube. I, I would assume it was the uncut, but uh, I guess I don't really know. They only had an SD version available, and uh, I don't know. Maybe they do. They have a Blu-ray of this film out that I could have bought if if I had time and, and foresight. Well, yeah. So Umbrella Entertainment has put this film out, I believe, three times. They did. Um, they did a DVD release. They did a Blu-ray release, and then they did a 4K remastered Blu-ray. Okay. I I, I would be interested to see that, just as a point of comparison. Well, first of all, they did an amazing job on the restoration. It's fucking gorgeous. Now, there is two cuts of this film. The original VHS version is the uncut version, and it has a few more bits of gore in it. I mean, it's nothing crazy, except for there's... Well, there's one seminal one where I'm like, holy shit, like... I wish that was still in the in the Blu-ray cut. But on the Blu-ray, you can watch um, the remastered cut version, and then you can watch the uncut version. Like It's like a VHS, quote-unquote, version on the disc. Um, or you can just watch the fucking deleted scenes. The, the cut that I watched, I was talking about in the chat earlier, Like I could swear there were various points in the movie where someone was saying, for fuck's sake, or they were dropping an F-bomb, and it looked like a TV edit. Like, there was no sound coming from their mouth. I mean, I guess I don't really think about it, but I don't remember any cursing at all in this film. Well, yeah, I didn't hear any cursing, but it doesn't mean there there may have been at some point. Because, like I said, there was one person who says it's a close-up after someone dies, and they're mouthing something. And I'm like, 
what did you just say there? I mean, this movie does a lot of violent shit. Mm. Yeah. That, like, cursing is the least amount of my uh, concerns. It's just something that, I, you know, once you mentioned it, I was like, ah, oh, now, you, now that you're saying that, I'm not sure. I didn't I didn't notice. Yeah, and I, f- I found it curious because I was like, okay, you know, what, what would cause someone to excise, uh, you know, foul language but keep in a lot of the violence? It's just strange to me. I wonder how, I, I mean, I guess I don't understand the the ratings board in Australia, especially in 84. Yeah, well, again, like, this is, okay, so this is, like, Ozploitation, but also not, like, because you have stuff like, you know, Death Warmed Up coming out around the same around the same time or like a couple years before that which is just like full out fucking like gore fest crazy shit but like it wasn't distributed like in 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 theaters i'm pretty sure okay i think even simon bosel tell told a story in his interview that we did with him of him seeing razorback like in the premiere yeah in sydney and there was like a big premiere and stuff i think the goal there was to make a film that was accessible to people sure but i mean they like it like a lot of people liken this film when they first saw it to like jaws or like a jaws ripoff which <sighs> I- <laughs> here we go again here we go again and i'm like Okay, like, why? Because it's a giant animal. Like, I feel like when Jaws came out, after that, everybody's like, oh, this is like fucking Jaws. There's like a giant monster. There's like a giant uh, uh, animal or whatever. Right, yeah. It's like Jaws, but it's on land. It's like Jaws, but it's a whale. It's like Jaws, but it's in a swamp. It's like, no, motherfuck. Like, Smith said this on an Orc episode, just from the research he did, that, and, and from the book itself. Like, clearly, it was a cash-in on Jaws, but like we talked about during that episode... Like, when you look at it constructively, yeah, there's little things here and there, but, you know, most of that movie's original. Sure. No, what I'm saying, well, there's a difference between cash-in and rip-off. Sure. No, yeah. Agreed. Like, The Last Shark is a fucking rip-off, or great, aka Great White. Like, that's a rip-off of Jaws with right. fucking Victor. Right, well, yeah. <laughs> like, straight up. <laughs> and Jaws, uh, Jaws 4 is a rip-off of Orca, so, you know, full circle. Well, there you go. Yeah, like, Devilfish and Orca are definitely cash-ins. I wouldn't say they're rip-offs. Yeah, well, yeah. And in this case, like, this movie feels more like, actually, we said this in Orca, like, this movie feels more like a Moby Dick uh, comparison than anything. Because oh, yeah. It has, it, because at the heart of it is still someone who has... You know, brain melting vengeance against uh, an animal. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's funny, you know, the way we work these schedules out. Sometimes we just every once in a while we'll have these happy accidents. Yeah, where you'll have a movie kind of just like that. You know, Orca, like you just said, Connor is kind of you know similar in some respects. And then we go into this film, basically another man versus nature scenario. Yeah, yeah. This is more like Orca than Jaws is like Orca. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is also based on a book <laughs> as well. Yeah, I saw that. Based on a book by Peter Brennan, which I need to pick up now. And I guess CB needs to pick up. <laughs> add it to the list. Yeah. Yeah, add it to the list. I want a Taking a Page episode on Razorback stat. In this case, though, this animal is far more, um, I wouldn't say mythological, but like I was rambling off giant pigs before, but this thing is a fucking monster. Oh, yeah. It's definitely more Jaws-like in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because it's just like a killing machine. It's not, there is no emotion to it. It's just kind of there. And it is a fucking wrecking ball. Oh, yeah. One of the things I said in the chat is like, I'm floored at the destruction. <laughs> One, it causes in universe. And two, like the production for the destruction, like the design and the effects and all that are astonishing. Oh, yeah. The fuck, like wrecking ball figuratively and literally. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um. So I also read that this the the inspiration for this might have been about that uh, the dingo ate my baby story the Azaria Chamberlain story oh shit yeah I, I could see that that it's like worked its way into our culture or our pop culture as like a big joke yeah, yeah which was like if, if you look into that at all you know obviously there's the Se- the Seinfeld joke that that Joe's referring to yeah but people were like pissed about that at the time I mean I don't blame them when you really think about what was going on yeah it's a big deal because the mother was blamed for the disappearance of her child and she had blamed it on a dingo right taking her baby away and people were like yeah what the fuck a fucking dingo couldn't have carried you what are you talking about and we we uh I mean we're about to talk about it but that's uh very clearly what happens in this film sure do you want to do a plot crunch to this I'll, I'll do a plot crunch go for it uh yeah so Basically, the plot crunch for this movie is uh, there's this big honking fucking hog uh, that everyone, you know, they refer to their pigs in uh, Australia as razorbacks. Or their boars. It, it comes in, it, it destroys this fucking old man's house and uh, carries off his grandson in the process. And like we were just talking about, no one believes him. You know, they, they don't have any evidence, but he's essentially shamed by the community. 
And then here comes the hot reporter from America to do a story on kangaroo and dingo violence. And uh, gets involved with this whole Razorback situation along with these kind of shady pet factory owners, Dicko and Benny, these brothers that are doing some nefarious shit at the pet pack. And uh, eventually it's... uh, it all comes to a fucking head after some murder and some intrigue and uh, some guy walking around the desert for what feels like an hour. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think that's basically the setup. It's basically like we kind of talked about, like a man versus nature kind of thing because you have each character has their own motivation for why they are going against this animal, essentially. Sure. And, and again, like, it's just... just real quick to compare it to jaws is just so fucking stupid like it doesn't it literally has nothing to do with that plot of how that movie goes down whatsoever unbelievably surface level couldn't be more different it's like you nitpicked like one thing you know like oh it's aimlessly attacking people like in jaws it's like jaws yeah it's just like this blanket comment that people who don't actually watch fucking movies say like they say (laughs) oh there's a giant monster well it's it's like jaws right but a but a boar and on land, and not like it at all. Hey, Ghostbusters, it's a Jaws ripoff. It had an <laughs> abnormally large uh, Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. That's clearly a Jaws reference. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah. Is Razorback the Dark Souls of animal movies? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Like, it's just so fucking stupid. Like, I don't know. I hate I hate that. Sure. No, I'm with you. It's unfair. It's unfair because right. when you say that to somebody, it automatically cheapens the film. Well, and it's like, you know, that whole argument we made last season for Terminator Salvation where it's just there's certain things that just, just through our own experiences and just stuff you read online that people write that movie off because it's like, oh, it's just another Terminator film. It's like, well, you know, it's you know, it's the future one. Who gives a shit? But it's like, yeah, but you're writing it off because you're just making a whole bunch of assumptions. And excuses. About what you think the plot is. Also, it's the future one. That's the one we've always wanted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no shit. Right. That's the only sequel you could have done after 2 PS. Also, this film is fucking gorgeous it plays out like a dream half the time and i said in the chat it reminds me of dust devil and it has some real stanley influence all over it yeah it's very it's very australian and it's very stanley and even and even miller like it, all of those things are here and even just the filmmaking again like is, is australian like osploitation like in general it's very surreal and beautiful and guess what it looks a lot better than jaws does well yes yes sure <laughs> It does. <laughs> it's shot more creatively than Jaws is. Sure is. Because Jaws, are like, there's, you know, there's memorable shots, but, like, nothing that really jumps out at you is out of the ordinary. No, this is like a fever dream of the Outback. And this movie has a sequence that, until it broke, I didn't know was a hallucination. Yeah. And it is fucking weird. <laughs> but you see how what I just said is unfair to Jaws? Well, it's unfair to this movie, and it's unfair to Jaws to compare the two. It, right, exactly. Yeah, don't compare Jaws to something fun. <laughs> We start off in this uh, farm town. It's very, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre-esque, like, Mad Mask-esque with the way this is shot in the beginning here. Yeah, go figure. I have a headcanon that this movie takes place weeks before the original Mad Max does. (laughs) At the same time, dude. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because it's a lot of those Australia stereotypes that we hear in America where it's like, it's just a fucking wasteland. Yeah. Because there's a lot of this movie that's just in the the outback, straight up. It feels very, like, post-apocalyptic-y. Yes. And uh, we start on this farm where we're introduced. We don't know his name yet, but his name is uh, Jake, Farmer Jake. I think it was Cullen. Jake Cullen, played by Bill Kerr. Yep. And uh, he's just basically walking around his farm and uh, making sure everything's secure. And he goes in to put his grandson, Scotty. Oh, little Scotty. He puts him to bed and immediately he starts hearing like a lot of like pig noises outside. And he's like, ah, son of a bitch, those damn hogs. And he grabs his rifle. (laughs) And he fucking heads out because we come to find out and, you know, probably totally justifiable. This man, he hates razor hogs. Well, he hates pigs. Well, he hates them because of the events that are about to take place. (laughs) Yes. When this fucking bullet train of a pig runs through his fucking house. This fucking locomotive of an animal, like one, its land speed is absurd. Um... Two, like, you don't get a full view of this thing, really, ever. At the end, sort of. And in the middle. Yeah, but, like, 
this thing is like the fucking size of a it's like the size of a Volkswagen bug or something. Like Dude, it is like the size of Santa's fucking bison in Santa's sleigh. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is so fucking big. I think one of the uh, yeah, the one of the main characters like draws the parallel to like a rhino as how big this fucking thing is. Yes. Yeah. And I got to say with the trajectory of this, uh, the speed it was moving, uh I feel like this thing was like aiming at this house from like up a hill like all right, a little bit to the left. <laughs> <laughs> a little to the right. Yeah. All right, go. And then just ran full fucking speed through this guy's house like the Flash or some shit. It's like shooting a wrecking ball out of a fucking cannon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's like a pinball. It hits one wall. High score! High score! High <laughs> score! As this fucking, like, house is just falling apart behind it. This fucking animal rips a hole through every single wall that it makes contact with. And just, it's running through this guy's house so violently and aggressively, it somehow starts a fire? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It knocks over, like, some lantern or shit. Okay. Because they don't have electricity out there, I don't think. I get Yeah, right. I think that's the implication. Make it very clear that we're out in literally the sticks of Australia like the the out out back <laughs> like yeah like even further out than uh Magnus Subansky in, in Crocodile Hunter the movie like she was in the outback this is even further out yeah this is like our fucking house runs on generators and there's like a perpetual fucking gas and or oil uh drip outside right and uh you know we we kind of already see where this is going or at least I did because of the trajectory of the impact, Farmer Jake runs in to check on his grandson, and he just hears crying as it gets quieter, and he realizes, oh shit, like, the, the thing took my grandson. Oh my god, it's the way that this is shot, yes. though, right? So this thing, like, blows out of the other side of the house and just runs off into the night. And the thing about this, a lot of times in this film is, again, there's nothing around, so the, the, the source point of the light is the house or establishment, wherever they're at, and everything else just falls off into nothing, like, into darkness so this thing runs away and it's like this dolly shot that pulls through the house and as it pulls back and jake walks through you just see the destruction that this thing just caused and then this fucking crib is just upturned and his grandson is gone and he he is wailing as you would expect for scott like scotty scott and the house is burning behind him. It's a powerful shot, dude. It's like, holy shit. And then the logo just comes in. Yeah, it's fucking great. <laughs> it, it's just so good. And of course, like we were talking about, nobody believes this guy. So the, the title screen comes up and then like over the credits are overlaying this hearing at this courthouse in Gamula is the town, which we later find out means intestine. This courthouse is full of Toe Cutters gang. All right, <laughs> every single fucking person in this building are all the most, like, degenerate, disgusting, sweaty, ridiculously hair-styled, like, hooligans I've ever fucking seen. And no one has, none of them has any business conducting a fucking hearing. No. No, they're like Mad Max ruffians for sure. They are all like, ha ha, yeah, yeah, the board took off your grandson. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're like, you know, all right, well, show us some evidence, Jake. And Jakey has, like, this, uh you know, little plot of sand that he pulled up with the hoof prints in it, and he goes to show them, and they tell him to, like, hold it a little higher, and it spills, and they all fucking laugh at him. Oh, yeah, it's just like Frankenstein on Bond. And, and then Frankenstein sitting, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> he's sitting there with Mary Shelley, like, fucking up the timeline. Yeah. <laughs> you think that your hurt was there, using his mind power? He's like, ah, <laughs> no one's gonna believe you about my giant razorback that I unleashed on your community. <laughs> For no reason. This takes me back to when I went to old-time Switzerland and fucked up that trial. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, the, like, his defense... Again, like, I feel like this is, like, a whole, like, recreation of that trial about that dingo case. Sure. And the lawyer makes a comment. He's like, he's like it was a hybrid species. It, it's an aberration. Oh. And the guy's like, aberration or apparition? And everybody just fucking points and laughs at him. Simon Basel stands up with the Elton John sunglasses on. Objection! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and rips him off. He's like, that son of a bitch! How dare you discredit this man's story about a potential aberration? <laughs> he's got, like, a bag full of the fucking... <laughs> <laughs> the lizards, the geckos. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's like, Mr. Basel, sit down. This is about boars, not geckos, all right? He says, I, uh, I, I stand against that comment. I have my lawyer, <laughs> Sir Dobby. <laughs> Dobby. I'd like to testify, please. <laughs> Dobby has like the still as the potato sack, but he has like just a name tag on that says Sir Dobby. 
I, I don't know. Just the visual of him being Simon Bosel's lawyer is funny. That's the bit. I have nothing more to add to it. <laughs> oh, man. He, no, he's like Rick Moranis in Ghostbusters 2. I took all my classes at night. Oh, that's real comforting. And that blue thing I got from her. And you can't shoot the boar until you release the proton packs. This, this isn't a hearing. You have no rights and he's not a lawyer. <laughs> You're an elf. Get out of here. We just keep him around because he's fun to look at. Look at him go. <laughs> May I return to my original place of existence? Yeah, whatever that means, Dobby. Oh, the pain shoots himself in the head. And Toe Cutter's gang gets up and fucking shoots him, and then he fucking ascends again. Yeah, they watch a murder happen in the room. Yeah. Harry Potter's there just out of, like, pure curiosity. He's just, like, fucking face palms, like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I had lunch with Ginny later, and now I gotta, I gotta call her and push it back. I can't go anywhere with you, can I? So, not only is, like, is he, um, berated by this group of people, but, like, even his daughter is there, and he's, and she's like, Yeah! She's like, this doesn't make any sense, like, the kid was dragged off, and, like, that's bullshit. Dude, this is like a house one situation. Yeah. Where it's like, the kid went in the swimming pool? Ah, there's no way I'm leaving you. Yeah. And it's like, the, the kid got dragged off by a razorback? Ah, there's no, there's no proof. And that's the thing, like, the fucking whole house burned down. So, like, he can't be like, look, that's where that giant thing ran through my house. Right, I'm sure there were people, you know, if we really want to, like, think about how this went... There was probably people at that trial saying, yeah, how do we know if he wasn't just buried under the house or in the house when it burned down? And this poor bastard has to hear all this. Right. And he was like, you know, it could have, they don't say it, but like, I'm thinking like, oh, maybe he had like a drinking problem or something. No. And <laughs> accidentally lit the house on fire and it fucking burned down. Nothing. Totally upstanding citizen, but it uh, doesn't do anything for you in society, clearly. So he gets released on insufficient evidence, uh, but there's, like, people spitting on him and shit. Oh, man. It's great because then he just, like, shoots up from sleeping, and it's like that that was, like, kind of his dream thing. Um, and he's, like, out, and he's camping out in the fucking bush to... Now he's got... You know, he's he's got to get his revenge and kill every fucking Razorback that's out in the outback. Yeah, yeah. Until he finds the big one. Sure. Which, I mean, I guess apparently they're a problem out there, but he makes it his vendetta. Oh, yeah, they're an invasive species for sure. Uh, especially in North Carolina. That's why Connor was saying that shit. I'm like, holy, like, goddamn, like, that, that's out there. Yeah. That big. Then we get a two years later uh, <laughs> a note, and we're, and we're flung from Australia to New York City, and I was like, what? What? That confused the fuck out of me. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> well, I did a Billy Joel music video, so it's like New York state of mind. Yeah. He, here we go. I have to ask, was this an American-made movie? No. It Well, it was shot on location in New York, and then it was shot in New South Wales, I believe. I guess because, and I know, like, this isn't a deal breaker for me or anything. It's just, like, weird. Like, you're doing an Australian film, but you got to insert these, like, two Americans into the equation. Like, why didn't you have them come from, like, Melbourne? Well, yeah. Like, that... like why do you got to go to a America like why do you got to make the lead a fucking American like just make it some Australian bloke I think it was to have the dynamic of they're out of towners kind of thing they're out of towners sticking their nose in fucking business that's that's none of theirs you know what I mean sure in, yeah in like the worst part of this foreign country not only that yeah like some shit we're gonna get into but like you don't fucking go out there talking like this fucking woman does I'm sorry yeah no yeah it was just, it brought me back to Rawhead as far as, like, leads go, where it's like, say what you will about that movie, but the main character is kind of like a fucking wet towel. Yeah. Um, sort of. I mean... I mean, towards the end, he kind of redeems himself, but there's a lot of that movie where it's just like, it's just a dude walking around taking pictures. Why is he the hero of this story? Well, to be fair, in this movie, Carl's like the third main, main, uh, character. He becomes the main character at some point. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, Judy Morris plays Beth Winters, and, um, so she is a character actress and a director. She co-directed and co-wrote Happy Feet. Still never seen that. With... George Miller. With George Miller, the director of Mad Max. <laughs> <laughs> These Mad Max people. It just keeps going deeper, man. They get on set, they see what they're working with. Yeah, no, this lines up. I've worked on Mad Max. Can you imagine how, like, a reunion of all these people? It's like, yay! Uh, <laughs> uh, we also have Gregory Harris as Carl Winters, uh, her husband. Yes. And just real quick, the fucking lighting in this apartment, every shot in this film is top notch like it's gorgeous yeah the lighting the set design the atmosphere it's just it feels so good and it just i don't know it's beautiful really well done probably one of the best parts of the movie is the lighting specifically and, and the cinematography for sure but to joe's point they're in their apartment 
and they're kind of playing a whole back and forth where because Beth is a, a basically a wildlife reporter, she always has to leave town for her job, and and they're kind of hemming and hawing. Oh, I can't believe we are gonna have to leave for our anniversary. And she's like, well, I have to go to Australia, so if I can get in, t- in contact, I will. But if not, he's like, they have phones there, right? She's like, yeah, I guess. Oh, wait, hold on. My report's coming on TV. Let's watch. And she's talking to some, like, ignorant-ass, like, radio, like rodeo guy. Isn't he, isn't he, like, a cow farmer? Oh, yeah, yeah, That's yeah, the whole yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. And she's like, she's like, how do you feel about slaughtering defenseless cows or some shit like that? And he's like, why don't you go fuck yourself, lady? <laughs> Yeah, more or less. He's like, why did I agree to this interview, you asshole? He's like, this goddamn bullshit. In her, in her defense, probably not the best way to lead the interview. Like, <laughs> No. He throws him no softballs, just goes right for the hard questions. Yeah. Oh, dude, she's totally that type of reporter, too. Hey, more, you know, I respect that. Yeah, no, absolutely. She fucking smears food all over the television. She's like, yeah, fuck that guy. Anyway, I'm going to Australia. <laughs> Let me ruin our pocket television, because I didn't like how that interview went. Yeah. <laughs> and she's just like, well, I'm going to Australia to report on the fucking kangaroo slaughter because they're going extinct question mark and i'm like this one town yeah yeah gumala is killing all the kangaroos <laughs> this this one this one absolute undisputed irrefutable shithole of a town in the in this whole country there's like 10 roo hunters that's it apparently all located in the same spot yeah but like i don't know <laughs> yeah no i agree yeah but here's the thing the the, the characters in question who we're going to meet soon are likely meth addicts and probably stay up all fucking night and just do one goddamn thing. Uh, they got some... They, they're some of the most disgusting people ever put to film. We'll get to it. I wanted to bathe the moment they came on screen. <laughs> <laughs> You felt like me after a recording session in the studio closet, but, like, you hadn't recorded yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, just, just this, like, I could smell them through my screen. Ooh, raunchy. We get a hint dropped here, like, she's like, ah, I'm, I'm gonna go, and he's like, no, you should go, you should totally go, it's all right, go Monday, and she's like, it's probably just my prenatal stress or whatever. Oh, man, that hit me later in the film. Yeah, the way this shit unfolds. Because I didn't put two and two together on that, and I was like, ooh. Yeah. Uh, so, so Carl, like, gives, uh, gives her, like, a present, and then they kind of kiss or whatever, and then we cut right to Australia. We cut to these little Aborigine kids, like, playing with this emu, and I thought it was the funniest thing. I guess it's just normal there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we, we go to this fucking hotel slash bar. Mostly a bar. <laughs> I, I didn't see a hotel bedroom. Welcome to the bar tell. <laughs> <laughs> Want to see a pop-up funny? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He's there? <laughs> well, you know, we're not quite sure if it's him or, like, his clone because he talks a little different. He's a, he's a little bit more, uh, Australian. <laughs> he's like, hi, hey, you want to see my pop-up funny, he say? It's Paul Hogan. Oh, my God. That ain't a pop-up funny. Now, this is a pop-up funny. He he is, like, the bartender's cousin. Oh, yeah, yeah. What would be the pop-up funnies in Australia? He just replaces a lot of things, like, from Neo-Japan with, like, Australian shit. So there's, like, spiders and crocodiles and koalas in there. All right. So Steve Irwin fell down a fell down a hole and became the Razorback. <laughs> Steve Irwin <laughs> fell down a whale and became Max Rokotansky. All right. <laughs> Steve Irwin. Found a gem the size of a monkey's head. Steve Irwin found a pile of shit. I'm already losing. I'm going Cockney, dude. Yeah, you know, you guys were starting to go Michael Keane, and I tried to go Michael Keane, but I just did, like, <laughs> a voice that really wasn't anything. I saw a bull the size of a tangerine. <laughs> <laughs> the size of a fucking tank. The size of a tank. The size of a rhino. Yeah, that Jim Carrey is not uh, exiting from the anus, specifically, but just a regular one. Can you imagine if Jim Carrey was driving this wild boar the entire film? <laughs> oh my god, Jim Carrey fucking climbs out of the anus of this wild boar. That's why it's so fucking destructive, it's just made of metal, and he's inside with two levers, his knees, like, up to his chin, just, like, just going, going back and forth. <laughs> Loser! Like a bat from hell! <laughs> <laughs> kind of hunting these razorbacks. <laughs> yeah, so they're in fucking, they're at the Gamola bar. Excuse me, I said intense, intestines before, it's actually, it means gut. Beth is there with uh, one other person, her cameraman, which I, I'm assuming is a local because he does have an Australian accent, and I... I don't think we ever get this dude's name, so I just referred to him as cameraman the entire time. Me too. It's cameraman. I think he's he's like from Sydney, and they like drive out from Sydney to there. I think. Sure. His name. His full name is Cam Uraman. <laughs> <laughs> Cam a uh, man. Honestly, I think this is what Ken did when he left uh, town. You know, in the book version of Orca. You know, we got Pierre in the book. You know, Smith kept telling us about this poor Pierre fuck. <laughs> Fucking 
<laughs> Pierre. But Ken, he went to Australia, changed his name, and started driving uh, people around <laughs> to, to far-flung towns. Oh, my God. Then we get, like, we just get to introduce to, like, all these people in this pub, and it's fucking great, because, like, one dude's riding a fucking camel. I did not expect the camel joke to come back as many times as it did. Twice we get two camel jokes. Yeah, yeah, I'm into it. Um, So, yeah, it's like a hunter pub. Like, this is where all the, the local people hang out, and, like... They make their living by killing kangaroos and boars and all kinds of shit, you know. We get this great scene when they first walk in the bar. Everyone stops. It's like Star Wars. Yeah. But, you know, they go back to what they're doing. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that was a little cliche. You're American. We don't serve their kind here. Cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> your, your cameras, get it out of here. <laughs> you think that's going to be the extent of it. And then she's like, hey, uh, anybody kill a kangaroo around here that wants to go on record? And then it's like full on record scratch. Everybody's like, get pissed. Oh, drunk. I, I read a book about Australian slang. <laughs> they all just stare at her. They all just shoot her. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Gilly, get out of here. You specifically get these two uh, characters that uh, th- that make their presence known. These two brothers, Dicko and Benny. Uh, specifically, Dicko I was referring to as Dark Guy for a while. A couple of Toe Cutters gang, and we see them. <laughs> like a- they are su- like both of them could easily. You could cut out Johnny the Boy and put either of these guys in that gang in the same role, and there would be no fucking difference. And like, like you can cut through that chain in about ten minutes, or you're anchoring about two. <laughs> <laughs> the one guy, like, I mean, they both look weird, but the one guy didn't look as weird, minus, like, those flippies that he fucking, or uh, those swimmies he has on, or whatever those are. The meth swimmies, as I called them. But then he takes his goggles off, and, in, like, one of his eyes is just totally clouded out. I was like, okay, that's a character quirk I, I kind of needed. Yeah, and again, like, they remind me of the guys from, uh, the, well, the one... The one guy specifically, uh, Benny, looks like one of the dudes from um, Death Warmed Up. I don't know if it's him. I didn't look it up, but it reminded me of it. Could be. We never know. One of them also dresses like um, uh, Lord Humongous's like fucking like announcer guy. The one who's like the Ayatollah of rock and roll. <laughs> oh yeah, because he has this big stupid fur coat and like this this weird headpiece. Um, they both dress like absolute douches and they both have like every time they smile it's just rotten brown filth in there they they've constantly got shit in their cheek they're chewing on their hair is just oil like that's it like it's just gross yeah they're walking farts they're yes (laughs) they're it's just two sentient trash cans like i they're just so detestable also benny's got like the the these fucking um this Walkman and he's playing the Wiz. Yeah, the entire movie and he's like singing, he's like dancing like Michael Jackson and singing like "Ease on Down the Road" and shit. Yeah, and he uh, intentionally slides whenever he's in motion. Like he stops and slides. <laughs> hey, they brought it all to these big characters. I guess why not? So she leaves the bar and and um, they get a beer or whatever or a pint rather or whatever they fucking call it. I forget. Some guy corrected us last time we did that. Some beer. Yeah. They call it all different kinds of things in all different parts of Australia, believe it or not. Anyway, uh, yeah, so they come outside, and uh, Jake roars up in his fucking uh, truck. His Jurassic Park truck. <laughs> yeah, she's like, she's like, come on, get the camera out. He's like, he's like, oh, but I'm drinking my fucking beer. And so they run over to him, and she's like, she's like, hey, uh, she's like, hey, uh, if you, can I, can I tell you about, uh, can you tell me about kangaroos and like hunting kangaroos and stuff? He's like, I don't know, I, I hunt boars, razorbacks. And she's like, oh, um, okay, so what? Why do you hunt boars? He's like, I don't know, I love blasting the shit out of a razorback. That brightens my whole day. <laughs> And she's like, okay. And then he just speeds away. And he's like, yeah, right, get fucked. And he just drives off. She's like, okay, he pulled up to uh, pull away. This is Beth Winters coming at you. <laughs> she pulled up to say how much he loves killing innocent animals. WTF 128. We're going to reuse this clip later. So Beth goes back into the uh, bar and she's trying to make a call. And before that, the bartender's like, she's like, he's like, you're going to try to call New York. She's like, he can't even get to Bick. She's like, well, I'm going to try anyway. So she's on this fucking, like, CB radio trying to make a call to New York City. Running up this guy's bill. <laughs> Did you dial 1-800-collect or what? She's like, what? No. Ah! <laughs> it's free for you and cheap for them. So Benny, like, goes to fuck with this lady, with with Beth, and he's like, he, like, throws the fucking, the, uh, they're playing darts, and he, like, throws, he, like, groups these darts, like, right next to her head. Oh, yeah. 
Dicko does that. Is that Dicko? I thought that was Benny. Benny is the guy with the glazed over eyes. Dicko is the other guy. Oh, okay, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, Dicko. Hey, then Dicko's the one with the fucking headphones, excuse me. Oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they're, they're both Dickos in my eyes, all right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly, Connor. <laughs> Who could care? Dicko one and Dicko two. The Dicko brothers. Dicko and Dicky. So she like she grabs the fucking darts out of the wall and like drops him in fucking Dicko's beer and walks out. And then everybody starts fucking laughing at him. I love this because like she schools these dudes and then like they dump the beer out onto the floor and just fucking break their glasses right on the bar floor. Here's the thing, and you kind of I forget who said it, if it was Joe or Connor, but like you're walking into town. This is basically like a mad, like you're basically a gasoline city. Yeah. Like, what are you, what are you doing, fucking with these people? Like, I get you're trying to like stand up for yourself. Sure. But these are bad dudes. You knew right away. Yeah, and that was my thing about this being like, not to offend like Australian people out there, but like your country has a reputation of being like somewhat inhospitable. Well, specifically in this scene, that's what they're trying to get across. Right. It's, it's rough out there. I don't live there, so I can't really speak for it, but this town is clearly painted as like the worst of the worst in the middle of like stretches of just godless, lawless wasteland. Yeah, basically. And this American woman walks in and fucks with people she doesn't know who are capable of things she's not aware of. In an area where you where phones are not reliable, there's barely any electricity, and certainly no actual organized form of law. No, this is like Wolf Creek. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, it is, it's the closest thing to walking to the Old West as you can come up with. Um, like, I don't think we see a cop in this entire movie. Maybe, like, one scene. No, I don't think I saw one either. No, they, they like, kind of rely on each other for that the closest thing to a cop is jake yeah and and just acts recklessly carelessly and uh like kind of pompously and then expects i guess you know no consequences sure not to say what happens later is in any way appropriate no no i mean i i like that she stands up for herself but i'm just thinking like two steps ahead of where that's gonna take you yeah exactly it is a, it is a foolish thing to do look what she does here is one thing what she does in about five minutes is something completely different sure yeah. so she leaves the bar and um they end up like getting a room there but she she tells the camera guy that she wants to just go get footage by herself I believe or some 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 footage of the cannery where our pet pack is the cannery yeah so she goes down there by herself. And she, she in fact, stops and gets some pictures of some boars? I, I, is that implied that she actually gets a shot of the Razorback? No, she's, like, turning the camera on and, like, testing it out, and then she sees it in the distance. Some, So it was just some cattle on the ridge there. It wasn't, uh, <laughs> it wasn't the Razorback, TM. You're kissing my balls. <laughs> God damn it, I saw that fucking Razorback. He was on the hill there. Killed my son. Killed my son while he's reading Secret Wars. <laughs> he killed Scotty, goddammit. So yeah, she just like starts up the camera and she, uh, she ends up driving out there. I guess so it's ready, right? Because it's film. It's not fucking digital. Sure. So she drives out to the, to the cannery and she ends up like shooting Dicko and Benny like through the window because they're doing like illegal shit with the kangaroos. Yeah. Canning this meat, um, like for sausage and shit, but then like selling other parts are like they're like hacking off certain parts of these kangaroos to sell in another a different market like china or some shit yeah like black market kind of shit I, am i getting that correct it's something they're doing yeah yeah well <laughs> keep in mind you know i make a texas chainsaw massacre reference a little bit earlier and I, i'm specifically talking about like the opening where it's like really showing off the desert aspect of the locale but take that in another direction where it's like I mean, obviously not Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but maybe, like, that vibe of this, like, rotten, disgusting, filthy meat factory. Yeah, well, that's... Texas Chainsaw literally is about the decay of Western civilization with the, you know, the slaughterhouses out there. Like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why they're doing what they're doing, because... The government has, like, shut them down and, like, all of this shit. And they're, like, basically isolated from the rest of the country. So whenever somebody comes through, they just... I don't know. Eat them? Yeah, we gotta eat. <laughs> yeah. We don't we like that special taste, that particular meat. Mm-mm. I mean, they lean into it in the second movie, but still. I definitely got Texas Chainsaw vibes from this, and I also got, believe it or not, uh, a film I definitely did not like doing on this show, but it made me think of it. Frankenstein's Army. <laughs> <laughs> What, the setting? Yeah, yeah, like, just, just the, the disarray of this uh, meat factory plant just made me think of a few of those locations in Frankenstein's army. Oh, it's, this, this is a slaughterhouse, not in the sense of, like, 
like a business or an establishment. This is a fucking gross horror zone. Like this, it's a nightmare situation. It's fucking vile. It's a basement. Yeah, it looks like it's been at a commission for like twenty years. Yeah, and they just have these kangaroo carcasses and pig carcasses hanging all over the place without any care put to it. No, and there's rats and shit all over the place. Ugh. So Toe Cutter's gang is there in their hideout, processing plant, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Um, and. So Beth's, like, shooting them through the window, and then fucking Dicko, like, sees her and, like, grabs her, busts the fucking, the rest of the window out and, like, grabs her through the window. Presumably destroys her camera in the process. Well, no, she grabs it. She she manages to get it away. Um, and then she goes to get in the car, and he's like, he's like, hey, what the fuck are you doing? And she's like, she's like, oh, I got, I got all the footage I need or whatever. And she's like, bye. And he's like, yeah, bye. Drives away. There's no way you could possibly get in another vehicle and chase me down. See ya. I got all the fucking evidence I need. You just went into a criminal's, like, lair. Yeah. And filmed them doing illegal shit. And you're not, like, going 150 miles and, like, pedal to the metal home. Not even pedal to the metal, but, like, you're lucky you got at... You're lucky that dude didn't fucking kill you right there. Sure. But again, you're out in the middle of nowhere. You can't phone anybody. Nobody's with you. You're alone. Yeah. Wouldn't you be a little scared? Well, she looks scared. Also, on top of that, I just want to bring this up. Like, we've mentioned that this is a little town. Who the fuck is... Worrying about this little town killing some kangaroos for some profit. Uh, Beth, apparently. Beth Winters. Uh, no, no, but I'm saying, like, like they're not... It's not like some big giant corporation running them into extinction. Do you know what I'm saying? And she yeah, makes yeah, that, yeah, she yeah. Makes that uh, comment, and I'm like... What? I was like, how the fuck are these two fucking dudes killing enough kangaroos to call, warrant extinction? You know what I mean? It is kind of ambulance chasing in a sense where it's like you you are you are over it, this. Granted, what they're doing is terrible. Sure. But um, you yourself are over sensationalizing to the point where you feel like you can just go do this on your own without any sort of like sure contingency plan or organized backup or sure a reliable way out if things go wrong. And, and I also get the impression that this pet pack storyline was it was initially probably grander in the script probably or in the story yeah well because like with the budget they had i'm guessing they didn't ha- i mean i think it was like a five million dollar budget i read mm-hmm. but they probably didn't have a lot to do or they could have like a ton of extras working in this meat factory plant to make it appear like a bigger deal sure and maybe it's a, maybe it's part of the pet pack like the bigger corporation and that's just like one uh foundry that's there or whatever you want to call it sure i guess it'd be a story be like hey are you hello large corporation are you aware you have a site out in this town that's doing this right i think yeah right like it like if the uh texas chainsaw massacre family (laughs) was cutting up people yeah yeah packing them up and shipping them out under like leatherface goods or some shit (laughs) they were like like a part of like pathmark or something like that (laughs) my brother makes a good hit cheese you you'll like it i don't know gunner can you shine some fucking light on that uh you know that was a part of my life i don't really talk about anymore don't don't bring up my past mistakes uh you know ever since i ascended i try not to associate myself with uh grandpa and the rest of the gang i handle all that business now so it's okay uh you know if i ever see him around if if god forbid any of them ascended you know i definitely uh talk to charnetsky and the boys to uh take him out before john hurt got his icky fingers involved in the uh the, the proverbial peanut butter of the situation. Our brand is specifically cruelty-free cannibalism, okay? <laughs> we just knock them right over the head before they have a chance to do anything. You know, Charnetsky and uh, Haggerty, they, 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 uh, you know, I, I was a sick person in life, but, uh, they've, they've turned into sick people after life, <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm not I'm not honestly cool with what they've been doing to Dobby, but uh, they're about as powerful as I am, and I'm not willing to have that kind of a showdown uh, when I would rather just watch the Bears game and uh, enjoy a little uh, deep-ditch pizza. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't really know how you got me on this tangent there, Sean, but uh, that that's my answer. Wait a second, Gunner. Why do you make me cut those people's faces off in the basement, then? <laughs> uh, 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 Haggerty, uh... Don't blow up my spot here. You said it was my brotherly duty that I had to do that to stay in the mansion. <laughs> Listen here, uh... I killed the Six Flags guy for you. <laughs> I'm just thinking about how I just offhandedly mentioned that in an episode, and now it's just canon. And that's the end of that character, everybody. <laughs> yeah, you gotta watch what you say, because everything becomes canon. Come on, come on, Haggerty, you know... I, I can't enact the violence I enacted in life anymore, but you, you're you're okay with it. I've seen what you've done to Dobby. The poor guy, he's just trying to live the life of a, of a simple house elf, and you torture the guy. You shoot him in the head with a, with a, 
with, with a fucking Magnum revolver. You're using my discrimination against Elf and Who. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you, they were bad. You can't just do that. You can't just use that against me, man. Also, I didn't know this was a point in the MDU where we could just kill a character like the Six Flags guy. <laughs> And Charnetsky's like, hey, I just want that fucker to go get me chicken. It's not even Haggerty's. Oh, shit, I just blew up my own spot. Meanwhile, in the corner, Richard Harris, who, uh, <laughs> you know, he, again, he doesn't come to every event, but since he is a wizard, he just pops in and out, like, when it's convenient. Yeah. And he's just doing, like, the side eye while he's listening to all this and just, like, we don't know what what Mr. Mr. Harris is thinking, Dumbledore, if you will, but, uh, you know, mother of God, it can't be good. <laughs> no, it can't. Uh, must have been a revenge killing. Well, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> that, can you imagine that guy shows up to the fucking, the, the, what's his name's house after the boars just ran through every wall and he just like goes, looks like it must have been a revenge killing. <laughs> <laughs> Gissing's there, he just flicks a fucking cigarette on the burning pile of ash. The interview Dumbledore at like the hearing. <laughs> yeah. I saw the whole thing. It was a son of, it, it was a hell of a thing. It's a hell of a storm. <laughs> Paying back that one car. Just like hell of a storm. Hell of a storm. So, so, uh, so yeah, Judy's driving down this fucking road and she's just happier than a pig and shit, man. She's just like smiling and like turning the radio on and enjoying a little Duran Duran. Yeah, she was. I thought she was going to fall asleep for a second. I, yeah, that's kind of what I thought she was doing. Like, oh, I'm getting tired. Let me jack the radio up. I thought for sure she was going to hit this fucking Razorback, but. She doesn't. She gets cut off by Benny and Dicko. She instead hits a kangaroo crossing sign, which I can only imagine is right next to the le leprechaun crossing sign. Probably. Gotta get that fucking book from How To Howard, man. Gotta fix that sign. Yeah. How to uh, dig a sign in signpost into the ground. Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah, we sure did. Yeah, so Dicko and Benny, like, run her off the road. And she, like, crashes through a bunch of fucking signs and, like, poles and shit, like a, like a small tree. Dicko comes out and, like, opens her door, and he's like, you all right in there? Did you, you get any, any broken bones or anything? And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. He's like, great. And he fucking grabs her by the hair and pulls her th into the middle of the fucking bush. Right, you're like, you almost think for a second that's going to be that. Like, he just, like, that's that's the intimidation tactic to make it so that she doesn't say shit about what happened. Sure. But no. So then, you know, he does what every fucking scumbag like this does in a movie, and he tries to rape her. Slaps her around a bit, too, and fucking gropes her. He sure does. And there's something extra gross about this because they're, because they're driving the truck that they hunt in so they have this big spotlight on it and that's how they like find kangaroos and shit yeah and they're like shining it in her face as as he's like tormenting her on the ground i mean i gotta be honest i was kind of half expecting benny to rip it out and just start pumping it away just you know watching his brother get it off with this poor woman he's he's ready He's going, eh, 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 eh. but we get, uh, you know, the magic of storytelling, <laughs> inserting this this Razorback as the hero for this scene. Um, yeah, oh, okay, which I kind of don't like. Right before that, he turns to Dicko, turns to Benny, and he has like these contacts in that like give him this weird eye shine, like he's an animal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then she knees him in the balls and tries to get away. Then the Razorback comes in. Yeah, Razorback comes in, tries to save her, like that crocodile movie when when the girl's about to have the same thing happen to her and this giant croc comes in and rips the guy off her. Yeah. Hero of the day. It ends up like hitting their truck and they like freak out and they jump in their truck and they and they drive away and then uh, Beth gets in her car. Which, this redeemed the scene for me, but I was kind of annoyed at first. Um, It's just a sad kind of scene because it's like, okay, the yeah. scumbags get away and now she's going to feel the reper repercussions of this, you know? I honestly, for a little while, thought she was going to be the main character of the movie and then I got Janet Lead. Yeah. <laughs> Unexpectedly. Connor, I'm going to take that a step further, and this might paint my opinion of the movie going forward, but this is like Godzilla. This this is this is like Brian Cranston getting taken out in the first 40 minutes of that movie, and then you got nothing to do with the main character the rest of the film. Yeah, in that you have a character with kind of a compelling story so far. Yeah. Where there's stakes uh, and like an emotional investment in it, and then they're suddenly removed. Yeah. Uh, I disagree. I, I mean, I won't totally agree because I think the character that comes in to replace her does have stakes in the matter. I just don't find this character as interesting at all. Um, I, I agree with, like, that perspective being a thing. I don't necessarily feel it the same way. But I did get some deflation sure. when I was like, oh, shit, sh like, this is it? I mean, I kind of like it on one hand because 
I mean, I guess we're talking around it. The thing comes in the car. Well, yeah. Rips off the fucking passenger door. Yeah, it's pretty intense. It's it's shot really well. Yeah. Rips off the fucking door, and it, like, grabs her by the leg and starts, like, eating her out of the car. Yes. So, on the VHS version, there's a little bit more gore. Not too much for this particular scene, but, like, you see a little bit more leg chomping and a little bit more, like, goring with the uh, with its tusk. But not. it's pretty much the same scene. I like that she almost gets away. Oh, when she tries to climb out the window? <laughs> <laughs> like, out the back, like, okay, let's say if you did get away for, like, a momentary respite, this thing, did, it, this is like Cujo, it didn't just disappear, it's still out there. Oh, yeah, no, for sure. I wouldn't liken her death to something like Brian Cranston and Godzilla, because that movie literally takes a shit after he dies. Sure, I mean, maybe I'm over-exaggerating a little, but that's, like, a uh, more recent film I can point to. Obviously, you could go to Psycho, that's kind of the, the other film that pops into my mind. Right, but it's, but I, I guess what I'm saying is that I still feel like Sarah and Jake are compelling enough to carry it, even though Carl is supposed to be the main character does that make sense yeah no i i could see that perspective for sure we'll, we'll get into it maybe maybe as i talk about it more i'll, I'll change my viewpoint but that's kind of where i'm standing with it at the moment gotcha but yeah she she gets 86 she does not survive the altercation so we cut to morning and it's um the uh, tow truck driver like going to like tow the car and like you really now we see it in like broad daylight and it's just totally fucked <laughs> And he's like, yeah, it's probably worth more, it, you know, it's going to be more expensive to fucking tow it out of here than it is uh, that I'll get any money for it. And, and like I was talking about earlier, there's no police force here. It's just Jake just there checking it out because he's doing his due diligence as a, ci as a civilian in the area. Like, oh, maybe this has to do with my fucking, my, uh, my ghost, basically. Of course he does because the, it ripped the side of this fucking car apart. <laughs> Dude, it's like some Jurassic Park shit. It is. I think it's even more fucked up than when the Rex rips the fucking car door off the Jeep, off of Eddie's Jeep. Oh, yeah. So Jake is looking at the uh, the boar prints, and he's like, he's big. And, <laughs> and the fucking tow truck driver's like, what? And then it just cuts. He's like, who's back? He's like, an old friend. <laughs> Who are you fucking talking to, Jake? Would you stop, lay off the booze, Jake. Jesus. Stop staring over to the horizon, goddammit. <laughs> so then Jake, again, pulls up... Uh, this is, I think, the first time we see this location. Uh, I, I kept referring to it as Gasoline City. Uh, oh, it is. It's like a giant oil tank that these motherfuckers <laughs> live in. Yeah, these these Mad Max motherfuckers. Oh, Gas gas Town. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, whatever. I'm not, you know, I, I was in the ballpark. I'm not the <laughs> expert on Mad Max, but I was I was close. Ga Gasoline City is the capital of the wasteland. <laughs> Okay. Oh, it was formerly Gasoline City. Form formerly Gasoline City. Well, the one brother is out there, and Jake's basically getting in his face. And I forget, maybe you guys could fill in the hole here, because I forget what happens, but it, the end result is they tell Jake to get the fuck out of there, and they just start shooting at his car as he pulls away. Yeah, well, he goes to confront, he finds a hook at the um, at the scene of the crime, which he knows is Benny and Dicko is from their truck. So he goes to their house. Right. And he's like, you fucking saw it, didn't you? And they're like, I don't know what you are talking about, mate. Is this where the uh, she fell down a mine shaft narrative pops up, or is that somewhere else? Yes! I couldn't fucking believe it. It was, like, made for this show. Well, not yet, because... Because they didn't even go to the cops yet or anything. Like, they, he doesn't even know... He doesn't go to talk to them about the disappearance of Beth. He goes to ask them if they saw the fucking Razorback. Yeah, right. And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. And then he just gets the fuck out of Dodge. We go to our uh, our shining airplane moment. I love this scene. This montage is done really, really well. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so Carl's in a... We don't see him fly to Australia, but he's in a bus going to Gallum. It's intercut with him like sleeping in the in the bus with footage from their conversation before Beth left and then actual like shot footage that that Beth shot while she was in Australia. It's really fucking cool how they do this like narratively. Right, cuz they just I guess the implication is a, he's kind of blaming himself because of that offhanded, like, no, you should go. Yeah. And B, like, he must have seen that footage. Like, we don't know how many days after she disappears mm -hmm. that he goes there. I'm assuming within a week at the most. Yeah, because he gets, like, a call, and, and he's like, what do you mean she's missing? And then, like, that's kind of thrown in there a little bit. Right. And then he wakes up, and then he's at, uh, you know, he's at the pub, or at the bus stop where he gets to the pub. I think this is one of the first instances where the movie uses this, uh, this, like, visual technique where, like, they, they like, something happens, and there's, like, three or four after images where, like, it's to emphasize, like, you know, some kind of, uh, impact on some one certain scene or something like that but it pops up a few more times too no i love it dude yeah so he gets to the pub and he's asking he's like yeah i'm looking for a room like who owns this and he's like i own it mate and he's like 
okay, great. And he's like, uh, do you know where I can get, like, a rent a car or a taxi? And, he's, and this guy's like, I haven't seen a taxi since 1953. And he was lost. He's like, you can take my car. <laughs> yeah, just have my car. Yeah, well, he, he, like, I don't know. Like, I feel like... Nice guy kind of situation. If you're not a scumbag like Dicko and Benny, like, you're also just, like, a nice dude. Who's just like, yeah, we all kind of help each other in the community here. Sure, but like we were kind of talking about earlier, this is like the epicenter of every scumbag in the, in the area is congregating here. Except for the owner, apparently. Well, I feel like everybody else is pretty, I mean, they're gross in a different way, right? As evidenced by later on in the film during the climax, like, yeah, it is a community that does come together and one of their own gets completely annihilated. Yeah, exactly. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's true. They, they do more about it than the people in Orca, put it that way. <laughs> For sure, <laughs> yeah. Do. Well, the, yeah, they just try to fucking push out no one. But it's very apparent in that scene where Dicko and Benny pour the beer out on the floor and leave that they're considered the two jerk-offs of the community. Oh, yeah, no one likes them. And why Why the fuck would you? Yeah, exactly. So then, you know, he borrows that guy's car, and they play this little joke about how he goes in the wrong side of the car because he's an American, and then he's on the wrong side of the road. He's like, the left! <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of appreciated that. It was funny. Yeah, basically, Carl's trying to find out, like, what happened to his wife, and the guy at the hotel saying, ah, oh, you, could, you could talk with uh, Jake Cullen. He might know. Mm -hmm. He's up the road, blah, blah, blah. So he goes to Jake's. Yeah. And I I guess Jake is just like, I mean, I guess it's been two years, so he's kind of fixed the place up, but he lives at the same location as his house, or is he just out on the on the outback? No, he's just out in the bush because we're going to get to the location where the other house was in a second. Okay. He's like living in a, like a, a, a cord out bus or some shit. Right. It's like a dump. Yeah. Just there's little touches to this scene that I, I really like. And, and again, like the lighting, the cinematography is fantastic, but like there's like, he still has his grandson's like rocking horse that we saw at the beginning of the film. And that's like in, in part of his house, like on the side, they go into his house. And I swear to God, I was looking around for one fully functioning vagina. <laughs> these fucking jars of pig fucking fetuses and stuff. Rucker Howard's in the back. That fucking jumped out at me too because he's like, it's when he's pointing out the pig heads on his wall and he's like, rah, 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 shot him in the head. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> <laughs> right beneath it is just a pig fetus in a fucking jar. Yeah. It sure is. <laughs> The fucking Van Damme clan comes in. He's like, oh, one of our people is just dying. He's got to eat that pig. The Australian uh, Van Damme. <laughs> Sean Claude comes in and eats the pig out of the fucking thing. He just fucking shoots him. He's like, goddamn cannibals. Well, you know what? He probably wouldn't shoot them because they're not Razorbacks. He's like, yeah, if you were a Razorback, you'd be dead. But since you're just a potato person, you can have the corpse. Give me five minutes. I'll eat these mushrooms. You'll look like fucking Razorbacks. <laughs> Yeah, I've been saving these for such an occasion. <laughs> God, imagine GVD riding the Razorback. Just going to put that <laughs> image in your head. It's, oh my God. You know, she likes riding the big animals. We've talked about it a few times on this show. A Van Dam riding the Razorback? Well, it could be a Van Dam or GVD specifically, but, you know, both visuals are funny in their own rights. What is she like, fucking Azog the Defiler on a fucking <laughs> white wog? She could be. She's riding the Razorback with a fucking mace. Holy <laughs> shit. I need that now. They call me the White Orc in some social circles. <laughs> <laughs> because in the moonlight, my skin appears to be luminescent. The Grey Potato. If there's ever a war and GVD's on the other side of history, you know Richard Harris is coming in on a fucking steed with the sword raised high. Oh, you know it, dude. Or, you know, it's probably a bottle of gin in his hand. He switches it up for the sword. <laughs> Mother of God. He is to you. He spins it real fast, takes a sip, then spins it back like it's a weapon. Like <laughs> People seriously thought I'd be replaced by uh, Ian McKellen in, in Harry Potter. That was a thing people really thought was going to happen. <laughs> they both played wizards. Who else could possibly fill that role? Literally nobody, apparently. Oh, wait, Michael Gammon. <laughs> Carl asks Jake about it. He's like, have you seen my wife? And he just like looks at him and walks into the back room where you guys were saying. And there's like all oh, Razorback heads on the wall and the, and the pig fetus. And he's like, yeah, Razorbacks. He's like, he's like, vicious shit in godless vermin. God and the devil couldn't have made a more despicable creature. And he's like, cool. So my wife's name is Beth. <laughs> <laughs> she might have been around here. She's American. Beth Winters, uh, ring a bell, news reporter. He has a different nervous system to most animals, you know. <laughs> Two states of being dangerous or dead. <laughs> He's like breaking it down like Rachel and Orca, just like giving all these animal facts, but not answering any questions that need to be answered. It's the only, it's the only mammal capable of vengeance. 
<laughs> just trying to find my wife. I'm trying to find out if she's alive or not. I never got a straight answer. I'm a, I'm a little heartbroken. It's called death in its eyes. Did you know a, a razorback could rip you from limb to limb? Bullshit. Definitely not your wife, but it could happen. Carl's like just backing out of the truck. He's like, where you going? I'm not done with me story. Go on with plan B. You're going to pretend I'm a Canadian tourist instead. He's like, <laughs> he just, Carl's like, um... So, do you know anything or what? And he's like, no proof. <laughs> Try the cannery. Do you know anything or not? He goes, know anything about what? What are you talking about? <laughs> Razorbix. He just, like, walks into this pet pack, and he's like, yeah, I'm Canadian. I'm a tourist. <laughs> you know, I might want to shoot a kangaroo. I, I heard you were the guys. He goes, you're American, huh? And he goes, no, I'm Canadian. And he goes, isn't that America, too? Yeah, well, I guess technically. Which is hilarious to me, because Australians think of New Zealand as essentially... Canada. Their Canada is New Zealand. <laughs> really? Yeah. That. Well, that's what somebody from Australia told me at a barbecue one time. <laughs> ah. At a barbecue, actually. <laughs> that's that big difference there. Key difference there. Gramps will tell you all about that. Just uh, go watch the video we were talking about earlier. Funny enough, I, I was actually talking to her about this film and she had never seen it. So here we are. Well, now you don't have an excuse. You have a, You can watch the movie and then hear three uh, white guys' opinions on it. <laughs> <laughs> three American white males. Yeah, not not even Australians. And here, here are three Americans doing bad impressions of your native your native tongue. I think if anybody's listened to the show long enough, it's just for a gag. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Also, uh, all my Australian accents come from either Mad Max or Bushworld Adventures. So. <laughs> Mine just come out of my head. I, I don't really do much uh, thought about it beforehand. They're probably offensive. I hope I didn't upset anybody. I think the three of us are more Australian than Mel Gibson is anyway. I'll, I'll own that. Why not? <laughs> So Carl goes into the factory, and like I said, he somehow convinces these guys to have them take him out on one of their kangaroo hunts. He's looking for work, and they put him to work in the cannery. And the whole point of this fucking scene is, A, to get him, like, an in with these guys, and B, so that he can witness this machine start to, like, it, you know, basically implode on itself, and all the other machinery in the factory essentially also... Uh, overheating in the process and watches one of the two brothers take this large stick and just like whap the shit out of this big piece of machinery and it fixes. Dude, it's the old man's furnace. Hush to go Pfeiffer! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who touched the goddamn dial? Yeah, I can see it because it, it immediately cools down and uh, Carl's like, I'm going to put that in the memory banks for later. <laughs> Uh, maybe that'll be part of the plot. Here I go. And so they, uh, after a day of work of Carl busting his ass for apparently no pay, yeah. he goes out on this uh, kangaroo hunt. Well, hold the fucking phone, dude. Because he, like, goes driving with these guys because he's like, no, I, I, I got a truck. I'm good. And he's like, nah, mate, we'll give you a ride. <laughs> and they fucking drive him to, like, their cave. Yeah. Or whatever. Oh, my God. This is like. Man. It is. They live in a literal pit. Yeah. And it's just covered in, like, piss and shit. They think the bombs were dropped and we literally are in a post-nuclear wasteland because why are you living in this fucking cave? It, it's, God, it's cool. It's fun. It is. It's a basically. It's a. Like a cavern, I think it's, it, it looks like the entrance to what would be a mining shaft or like a mining like area, but yeah, it's got, it's got a door. Right. You know, you turn down the wrong fucking uh, entryway and you're going to run into P head. Oh yeah. Yeah. For sure. uh, yeah, exactly. Um, But like, it's got a door on the exterior that just goes, when you go in, it goes straight down into this like extended, like just cavern essentially. Yeah. But they've turned it into basically just like a dumping ground that they live in. It looks like the hills have eyes. Like, is there yeah. there's just like a shitty bed frame with like piss stained sheets all over it and God knows what else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a garbage dump that someone's tried to like, you know, shack up in. Yeah, and he's like, uh, I gotta take a shower. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> that ain't no shower, mate. You can stand under the pipe outside for a little while. Yeah. And I make the Fallout references specifically because I've played a lot of Fallout 3 and a lot of New Vegas, and I have found many caves that fit this description exactly where there's just, like, a couple of sleeping bags and a bunch of garbage thrown all over the place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, that was after post-nuclear war. This is uh, just in Australia, randomly, next to where they hunt kangaroos, I guess. In the middle of nowhere. You can find stuff like this in the Mad Max game where, uh, like, war boys or roadkill gang members hang out, where you, you find a door or some kind of, like, man-made entrance that leads into, like, just a fucking pit hit or a dump or a cat or a series of caves like uh so yeah this seems uh very plausible but also nowhere i want to be no very aussie yeah 
Yeah. No, hell no. I don't even know how this this guy, how he manages to go down there and like sleep and eat this guy's sausage. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Buying his mate. <laughs> then we go from this like cave fucking bedroom to this like character that they just decide to like insert into the film for two parts that I kind of love. Hey man, that's that's my brother, man. What are you <laughs> Dave Haggerty. Oh my god, the unascended Haggerty? Let me see if I can do this. Let me see if I can do Sleepy Haggerty in an Australian accent. Ready? Go for it. I want to hear this. Oh, I, I don't know if I can do it or not. <laughs> I don't know if it's even sounding even close. <laughs> But there's my... You sound like Michael Caine doing, like, a Monty Python impression. <laughs> it's so... You're just Michael Caine. It's so hard to do that kind of inflection, but also be Australian at the same time. It's hard. Anyway, Australian Haggerty. This guy is Haggerty as fuck, yeah. I'm just minding my business in my own house, and suddenly, you know, there's a noise outside. I was minding my own business in my house, and here he, he, he go. I was drinking my beer on my couch, watching some guy on television. And now you're like, now you're Southern American, you're also... Because I'm trying to, because I'm trying to keep that... That, that Yeah, you're doing three accents at once. It's not easy. I know, it's impossible. <laughs> it's like trying to do a British Korean accent. Because you're doing the sleepy Haggerty, you're doing doing Australian, and then you're trying to make it a little uh, younger at the same time. <laughs> Anyway, Dave Haggerty, everybody. Yeah, this guy who has all, all his animals essentially get killed by this Razorback. Uh, we see this guy twice in this movie for whatever reason. Yeah, so he goes out the first time to check on, like, the ruckus he hears while he's, you know, it interrupts the late night show, so he's got to go check it out. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, buddy, your barn's totally destroyed and all your animals are gutted. And he's just like, huh, that's weird. Doesn't think anything of it. Is that what happened? I thought he just, like, heard a noise and walked out. No, nah, he sees them. And then, you know, you want to just talk about the scene that, that, that it, where he comes back now? Yeah, because, like, it, I feel like the scene was split in two, right? Like it, it feels like it. One plays now, and then one plays later, and it's the same scene. Because he goes, it's almost like he just went back inside and started watching his program again. Yeah. The Razorback gets, like, stuck in, like, some, like, equipment or some shit. It's, like, taking a nap or something. Yeah, I was just, a, yeah, I was just about to go into it. <laughs> he get, it's, like, gets, like, caught in, he, like, sets a trap, and it gets caught in a net. Oh, okay. And it's, like, chained to the side of his house, and this fucking Razorback starts running away, and it pulls the side of his house off with the television <laughs> on it, and this guy is just <laughs> sitting in his chair in his Lazy Boy. Dude, his house gets venomed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just say, it's this is one of those spectacular pieces of carnage in this movie, um, because... Love it. This thing, like, the whole house like the, the corner of his house gets with his television the television that stays on the whole time <laughs> by the way into the night it just goes and he watches it as it goes it goes away into the distance oh yeah man and fucking earl bast and grady hoover were there hey man maybe he had a generator in that part of the house or you know his brother came in and set it up for him you know gave him the illegal cable but you know added a little magic uh to the to it he'll never need a power cable for this tv all right it comes from above <laughs> Don't ask me about it. You'll be fine. It'll it'll be fine. You can get you get to Playboy Channel too. There you go. Can I have an indestructible house? No. <laughs> <laughs> Slam cut to the uh, wizard's mansion, and Charnetsky goes into like one of the spare rooms. Like, hey, where the hell's the tube box? <laughs> <laughs> where the hell is it? I wanted to watch the ad I wanted to watch the fucking Stooges in here. Where's my fucking TV? <laughs> Where's my fucking TV with Puppet Master Two on it? God damn it! Allie Oates walks in. She, you know, she's she's gotten out of the uh, the the clothes covering at this point. You know, she's back in her regular uh, outfit, and she's like, "Geez, Charnitsky, you're a damn wizard. Why don't you just snap your fingers and make a new one?" And he's just like, you know. People ask me the same thing about why we keep killing Dobby. We could just make the chunky chicken. We could just make it. But you know what? It's not the same. It's not the fucking same, Mally. I'm not that kind of wizard, okay? Also, she's not in her rags because she's not on patrol in Star City with her son, Ragman. Yeah, well, this right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's got to go to her other job, you know, investigating uh, Kyoshi and other demonic children. Yes, exactly. Yeah. If I don't touch it, I don't know anything about it, so here I go. God, imagine if she touched one of the wizard's robes, like the nightmare fuel that would just be oh. injected into her at that moment. I feel like if she touches Charnetsky's robe, it's just like that scene from Society where everybody's melding into each other, but like with chicken. Oh no. You know, it's just it's just the, the shit that Cartman sees in that one episode where he thinks he's a psychic, where it's just like people pouring syrup over over chicken. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, I don't want this question answered. I, I, I don't want to know what she sees when she touches these men. In any capacity. She touches Haggerty's and it's just a scene from Event Horizon. Like <laughs> She just gets really high on cocaine. <laughs> so we so we cut back to the fucking pit of shit. And um, Carl wakes up and they're like, Wikey, wikey, hands off, Snikey. Get it? It's a jacking off joke. 
Get it? You're touching your dick when you're sleeping. So Carl's like, yeah, uh, so I went to I went to Jake and he told me, like, where to find you guys for, like, opal mining and stuff. Uh, by the way, uh, you ever hear, like, this American woman, what happened to her? And they're like, what? He's like, uh, yeah, there was an American woman that came up here. He's like, I don't know what you're... T they're like, we don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Kind of a weird thing to bring up out of nowhere there, friend. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were hunting ruse. You're not talking about Beth Winters, are you? <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't happen to know her personally, would you? <laughs> what was your name again? Carl Winters, you said? Uh, yeah, no relation. None, none at all. It's just a we weird, right? <laughs> nope. My name's Bill... Bill Denver. I'm the from the uh, Canadian Winters, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Not the American winters. So, yeah, so then they gear up to go fucking kangaroo hunting at, like, night, and he's like, yeah, you better put a fucking blanket on, mate, because it's cold as shit. Dude, they drive around, and their whole plan of killing these things is, like, have Carl stand, <laughs> like, up and in, stand up in the car through the sunroof with a spotlight. Yeah, to, like, find the roux, and then they shoot it. Yeah. So that so they uh they do find the quote unquote rue. Yeah, there's there, they go to this spot where there's like a fucking car in a tree and shit. <laughs> I'm like, how the fuck did that car get there? I don't know. Mysteries, uh, movie magic, clearly. So he's holding the spotlight on this kangaroo, and Deco like or Dicko, whatever the fuck you say, it shoots this kangaroo, but it's like not dead. And it's just, like, screaming in the background. Yeah. But then that's another movie where the kangaroo goes after Deco for revenge. <laughs> yep. Well, the whole thing is when he goes, he shoots the gun, Tr uh, Carl, who acts like a tough guy this whole time about killing deer and this, that, and the other thing, yeah. he gets scared from the gunshot and drops the spotlight, which causes uh, Dicko to fucking miss his shot and basically just maim this thing. Mm -hmm. And then he, like, barfs all over Dicko's head and, like, yeah, yeah, you're so tough when you're hunting deer, huh? Does this happen when you're hunting deer? Who has no reaction to being puked on, by the way. No, he's like, oh, he goes, oh, that that's great. He says he says some shit, like, that's charming or some shit. He's like, ah, oh, free mail. They're like, oh, you got to kill it. And they're like, no, nah, mate, he's, he's all, it's already over. Like, you know, we can't do anything with it. Right, it's going to die eventually. We don't give a shit. So he fucking takes a cleaver and he goes out and he fucking chops this thing's head off and then he's just like completely in shock that he had to do that and they just like leave him there they're like we'll be back in like six hours good luck and he's like do you check up when you shoot deer then stay here yeah they leave him with just like a blanket and he is like curling up next to this kill i guess like out of shock and also to warm up dude he fucking taunt taunt sleeping bags this thing and i thought they smelled bad on the outside well Apparently not, because he has this nightmarish dream. He has, well, he has this crazy dream, but then, like, it's not a dream? Well, it's like a mix. He, he basically is, like, imagining, like, a bunch of animals are chasing him and shit, and, like, even the Razorback gets inserted into it. Yeah, and then, like, Deco shows up and, like, blows his brains out, and then, like, he wakes up, because he hears, like, pigs. Right, and there's also, like, slow-mo shots of, like, those brothers bringing down a cleaver yeah. and stuff like that. It's, it's weird. It's trippy. It's very surreal, and, it, and, it, and again, it just, it's a, it's a testament to the filmmaking like it's just shot and done really well i was gonna say i wasn't sure if it was if it was this or the thing that happened like in a few minutes oh it's gonna it's coming in a second <laughs> so he starts running through the night in the middle of the bush just like out wherever and he keeps tripping by the way like he continuously is tripping in mud and over fencing and barbed wire fencing and like just busting his ass and more barbed wire fencing yeah and he like th now this is where i thought that this was the original place where Jake's home was because that weather vane is there again that weather vane tower oh yeah I didn't even think of that you might be onto something so maybe and like that's why the boar fucking ran through the house in the first place maybe like made it like it's home essentially and then just like from two years of erosion from a house burning in that location we get this mud pit yeah I mean it could be I don't I'm not sure but there's like a shack and there's like a weather vane I could see it though and there's like a big thing of like water like mud shit water hole and he ends up climbing this weather vane and like falls asleep sleep and uh he's woken up by raised like other like smaller pigs like razorbacks like fucking hitting the fucking weather vane and like knocking it around hey meat's back on the table boys <laughs> <laughs> shit's fucking scary dude it's fucked up because they like they push this thing over into and he like falls into this fucking shithole water and the pigs are trying to go after him and I guess they can't swim, and he like he's like, yeah, fuck you, you can't swim, can you? <laughs> I was waiting for an alligator or a croc to come out. Yeah. <laughs> for people who think that pigs are harmless, pigs are fucking terrifying because people will disappear 
by falling into their pig pens and being devoured by their own pigs, all right? Pigs are, they're disgusting. Especially boars, though. Like, the wild the wild pigs? Yes. They're fucking nasty as shit, dude. They will kill you and eat you. <laughs> yes. One killed Robert Baratheon. You know, he was drunk, <laughs> but still killed him. And uh, so, so all these pigs, like, book it out of there. And he's like, huh, it's kind of interesting. Oh, by the way, what's that gigantic one I kind of saw out of the corner of my eye, but it didn't really do anything? Huh. <laughs> just was there ah well i guess i'm okay let me get out of this mud and just start like walking through the desert oh my god dude so he just hoofs it back to he doesn't even know where and he ends up like if there was ever a dark souls ass moment in a movie this was it at some point he trips and like face he face plants the dirt and starts digging a hole and then just passes out in the hole yeah and then slam cuts to him walking across a fucking salt stretch yeah that's what i was gonna say with a huge crack in it yeah with a huge abyssal crack in the middle of it yeah there's all these crazy like surreal landscapes with like flares and shooting stars and then like connor said like he's walking across this uh huge like salt flat um and it's gorgeous, by the way. <laughs> and, like, an area with, like, crystals and, like, the Fortress of Solitude or some shit. <laughs> yeah, and, like, at some point he comes across this, like, this this crudely created sculpture of a of a horse made with nothing but horse bones and sticks. Um, no, I'm pretty sure that's Slim Razor's horse. <laughs> okay, yeah, I like that better. It's like a mummy horse. Yeah. With his share wig. He, like, hallucinates this thing breaking through, like, the salt flat. Yeah. And, like, coming out and chasing him through the fucking desert. That's what I'm saying, man. Dark Souls. <laughs> it, it's like every location, you know, basically uh, best of hits. <laughs> Filmed by David Lynch, you know. Richard Stanley. Yeah, lots of just angry, inhospitable, depressing landscapes. Yeah, it's fucking, it, it's great, though. And and again, like, this part is very, very Stanley. And then we, we go back to, apparently, he just was knocked out again and was just imagining all that. Yeah, and then he, like, wakes up. He, like, stumbles into, um, Sarah was a character that was introduced before, but we haven't, like, heard her speak at all yet. Right. But he ends up, like, walking towards her, and she's, like, in her shower outside, which is basically just, like, a big water tank that's outside. Yep. And he's like, hey, and she turns around and screams, and then he just, like, faints. No, uh, no cursing, uh, cutting back a little violence, but we definitely gotta get the tits in there somehow. They didn't show her boobs. Oh, they showed them! Uh, in my cut, they were, you, if you blinked, you would miss them. Uh, probably then. I blinked. Regardless, she's definitely naked, <laughs> and he faints. Sarah Cameron, by the way, played by Arky Whiteley. Or Whitley, however you say that. And we, we cut to, uh, presumably, the next morning or later in the day, and he's in bed. And, uh... Tom Everett Scott's there. Yeah. <laughs> that, yep. <laughs> pretty much. Because we get that fake out. Oh, yeah. Where she's sitting in the bed, and she turns around, and uh, admittedly, like, really good makeup effect for this, with a uh, boar face, like, roars at him, and then he wakes up again. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's, it's, it's done well. And she's like, oh, oh, glad to see you awake. She's like, I'm Sarah, your new wife. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, I'm Sarah, Jake's daughter. Hello, my name's Dr. Angelo, and you're my new wife. <laughs> it's weird yeah. how this relationship uh, blossoms, let's say. I love how he's just like, yeah, whatever, she's dead. Do you Have you seen my wife? She's like, I heard she fell down a mine shaft. Yeah. And he's like, well, that's it, I'm divorced. Well, okay, well, I'm divorced. <laughs> well, hell of a thing. <laughs> God rest her soul. <laughs> Hell of a storm. And then he's like, oh, I saw a huge boar. A boar is as big as a rhino. Yes. And then it, like, cuts, and then, like, Jake is there, and he's like, he's like, you seen it? You saw the the boar, the razorback. The big old RB. <laughs> the big one. Oh, I told you. Now, who is this Beth woman you keep bringing up? I'm sorry, mate. Your you, you, you shield is dead. <laughs> That's it. Get over it. Yeah, in fact, he goes to, like, that mud hole looking for the razorback. And he, uh, I mean, I'll talk about it a little more in a second, but he finds her ring basically in, in the mud hole and is like, yeah, she's definitely dead. He, well, here, before he does that, he, like, tells Carl that, like, the Razorback took his grandson. Right. And then, and then Jake goes out and, and she's like, she's like, oh, you can't go by yourself. And he's like, he's my boy. I'm going to kill him by myself. Oh, yeah. And he's like, I'm bringing the big gun. She's like, bring the dark gun. And he's like, I don't need your stupid dark gun. I'm going to kill this thing. She's like, you can track it. He's like, I don't want to track it. I want to kill it. She's like, you can track it to kill it, you dumb old man. She gave him the rifle with the appropriate equipment that Bo Derek should have given Richard Harris in Orca. Right, I guess. Instead of this honking fucking thing that he just blows the uh, the, the female away the second she gets hit by it. Well, I thought he was going to trank the, the razor back. Same. But he's track 
the razor back. And I didn't realize that till later, which we'll get to. We see, like, Sarah has a pet wombat, which I thought was fucking yeah. hilarious. She also sees uh, Carl in the shower, you know, a little, uh, little payback. Yeah, she's like, hey, how you doing? You, you trying to drown the flies or whatever? And he's like, ha ha, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm Canadian. I don't get it. She, like, gives him her dad's clothes and stuff, and then we get, like, a little, um... Exposition. She's like, yeah, my mom died last year. And then we get this, we get a lore dump about why, or something's going on with the Razorbacks. Now, what she does is she kind of like captures them and tags them and then like releases them and studies them. Right. She makes a comment like, the sicker they get, the hungrier they become. And she's like been finding teeth and she even like extracted like a stress ulcer from one of them. And they're like, oh, what? Are, I guess pigs get stressed out or whatever. It's weird because we don't really ever get an answer as to why the Razorback is so big. It's just literally just because it's like an aberration. Yeah. Like it's literally like it's an it's a natural freak of nature. Like Oh yeah, it's an absolute it's it's a it's a quagmire in the natural structure. Like it's it's it should not exist and like like I said, that list of boars before, but like also like every once in a while you'll come across like especially like a predator. Mm -hmm. Like a good example is Gustav the crocodile in Africa. Yes. He's like 30 fucking feet long, like, apparently apparently 70 years old, and is massive and extremely aggressive, and no one really knows why. Um, the thing with that is, like, reptiles keep growing as long as they stay alive. Yeah. But he's he's bigger than most of his other reptiles around him. He's also so dangerous that apparently, like, people have seen hippos swim away from him. Holy shit, dude. To the point about, like, the other warthogs, uh, the other razorbacks, like, why they're stressed and why they're acting the way they are, I think, is indirectly because of the the main Razorback. Because oh, it's yeah. basically like, you know, the matriarch or patriarch. I guess we don't ever really know one way or the other. Sure. And they're all afraid of it, because every time it comes on the scene, they get the fuck out of Dodge. Oh, totally. I just wanted to put that I just want to put that out there because they don't it's not like man made mutation, right? It's not like Oh yeah, no. It's not like alligator like the movie Alligator or something like that. It's just like a natural occurrence. Quote, unquote. <laughs> but then we cut to Jake, yeah. Sure, and then Jake's down at this, like, mud hole. Which is where uh, he was uh, the first time. Yes, yes, and also where Carl was stuck previously. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, he's got a rifle with him, and he's kind of, like, scouting the whole area. And he sees behind, like, some fucking debris the Razorback. And I shit you not, he, he lowers this rifle, stares into the camera, and just goes... Jesus wept. <laughs> he sure does. <laughs> he like freaks out and he like takes all his dogs and like lets them go and he's like, we're just gonna take a lot to take this bugger down and he fucking like... Th yeah, all, all his dogs, by the way, that he only names one of them so I guess he doesn't give as much of a shit about the rest. He's like, all right, Spider and others, <laughs> attack! <laughs> and he's just like unloading into this fucking Razorback that's just sitting there. Yeah. Like, minding its own business. It's like Snorlax, and it's just, like, getting peppered by this bullshit. <laughs> and he, so, so he, he's like, oh, yeah, the dart, and he fucking raises the dart and shoots the dart, and then just screams off into the distance when it runs away. In, in a very comical edit, I must add. Um, yeah, they like, freeze, they, like, freeze frame and push in on him. Dude, it made me think of that music video. I don't know the song, but I... You guys probably know what I'm talking about, where that guy's just like, whoa, like that cowboy guy is singing and just screaming. I have no idea. I have no sense in post than it does now. <laughs> so Jake, like, takes a, a a plaster cast of, like, the, the hoof print or the whatever you want to call it. Right. What he tried to do earlier, but efficiently this time. Now I got proof. He's like, now I didn't have plaster then, but now I got plaster. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was thinking to myself, like, why didn't he just bring a fucking camera with him? Well, he's old school, man. He doesn't, you know, he just goes out there with a gun. He doesn't think with his head. Well, because the, the, the nearest person who has a camera is probably two miles away. The nearest person who has a camera got eaten alive. Yeah, but he would, like, procure a camera at some point. You would think, right? He's like, well, you know, I saw that American lady with a camera, and she got fucking eaten alive, so I'm good. I'm not chancing it. Well, sure. So he, he ends up, so it gets away, and he ends up, like, finding, like, Judy's or, excuse me, Beth's remains, like, in the mud. Yes, and that's how he gets, like, her wedding ring. or the, I think it was actually the ring he gave her before she left. Yes. Like, her anniversary gift. And he tells Carl, and he's like, hell of a thing, sorry. <laughs> he goes, don't believe me now! That's all he cares about. <laughs> Look! You'll find love again. Hello, Sarah. Have you met my daughter? He's got, like, feigned tears. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm so broken up about it. Hi, you're also blonde. <laughs> <laughs> then? Sarah, I mean, she's already been kind of painted as, like, a researcher, but then she goes full Oracle as, like, Dad's like, all right, I, got, I shot it with the dart. Like, can you pull up where it is? She's like, all right, don't mind if I do. 
goes on the computer and has like a grid program pulled up. He's like, yep, it's right here. This is some fucking Tremors 2 shit, dude. I, I love the close-ups of her fingers hammering the keys <laughs> on her little keyboard. Yeah. It's like the hacking. <laughs> it's awesome because it's like a mechanical keyboard. So it's like chugga, 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 chugga. It also looks like whatever is on her screen is just like a filament gel like placed over the screen and it looks like like she has like uh what is it an overhead projector like sheet that she lays over the computer screen a transparency and so that acts as her map and then the computer like that's a map of the area and yeah her screen has like a blip that she can track but like again like the tremors 2 thing like when fucking earl and grady are like chasing the fucking graboids with their little tv in their fucking truck yes that's the same shit as this movie. Excuse my French. Pardon my French. Uh, we also, I think here's where we find out, if you didn't hear that uh, line earlier in the film, that his wife was uh, six months pregnant. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, wow. She wasn't showing, that's for sure. A lot of fetal death in season three of Movie Dumpster. I'm just gonna say, we, uh, a lot of movies where the baby doesn't make it. Is that like the year of the fetus? Like the chi- like the Chinese thing where you're like- Yeah, but my, also, my point to that is like, it is an easy trope to fall on, so it's no wonder why we've come across it so many times. It's just funny how frequently it's been coming up lately. Maybe not funny. Funny is probably the wrong word. Well, it's funny because they all congregate together in the same spot. They go to, like, the fetus bar. Oh, no. (laughs) No, Well, you know, the suckling... When it gets done with its game of cards with the MDU's APA, Cumdar, and, uh... With the chuds. Corpse fucker, obviously. You know, it goes to the local bar. You know, they have the clown bar and shakes the clown, but there's also a fetus bar. (laughs) Clown bar. You know, the the bartender there is just, uh, you know, an eight-month-long abortion, and so, you know... To put that horrible visual in your mind, serving drinks. This is me distancing myself from that joke. <laughs> um, I'm just going to end it there because I could take this in some pretty dark places. In fact, I think I already have. But, you know, the beings there. Yeah. The sucklings there. The orklings there. They're all there. You know what? Honestly, even Richard Harris is Nolan's son. <laughs> uh, that was his unborn son or daughter is there. And now, Beth and Carl's baby is there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And that in that uh, boar fetus in that jar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> wow. So Jake has the tracker, and he goes out again to uh, go hunt the Razorback, and then Carl is going to leave home the next day and all that kind of shit. Yeah, he's kind of just like, I came out to find out what happened to my wife. I found out what happened to her. I have nothing else to gain here. So I'm just going to go home. Bye. This man, Jake, uh, honestly, I didn't see this coming at all, and I felt so fucking bad for this guy. I know. Well, the, in the bar back in town, Sarah is talking to one of the dudes over the CB, I think the tow truck guy, and Benny and Dicko are in the fucking bar, and he, and she makes a comment like, oh, Jake might know what happened to that American woman, and they overhear that. So then, right. while Jake is out hunting or waiting for the, for the uh, Razorback TM to show up, they go out there, and they're like, oh, we gotta, we gotta fucking kill him. So they go out there, and um, he's like asleep, and um, they hold him up at gunpoint, and they end up like, uh, Benny like ends up like hitting him over the head with his rifle, and then basically just like, well, what are you going to do, Deco? Are you going to fucking kill him or what? He ends up taking like a fucking hatchet and like breaking, like, like, like smashing this guy's kneecap. So... Mind you, Jake's first run-in with the Razorback, we forgot to mention, but it, like, broke his leg, so he has, like, a fake leg, or, like, it doesn't work. So now both of his legs don't work. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, like, in the middle of the fucking bush, and he can't move. And he's he's KO'd while he does this, so... Yeah. Not only does he have his leg basically made useless, crippled by these assholes, for no reason, really, other than he might tell on them yeah he might tell on them and he's like he's like cops what are you even talking about right well he wakes up after he was knocked out like in the morning so you know first of all thank god he didn't get eaten alive at that point well sure yeah but he sees the injury and then the the adrenaline must be rushing through his body and he just screams in agony and just like total defeat like why me like it's it's heart-wrenching when he's he's clutching one of his dogs um spider yeah he's clutching spider uh and it pans out and benny and dicko have killed the other two dogs yes and at at this point i was like i want just like an avalanche to kill these two fucks yeah i know dude and then like jake sends uh spider like to go get sarah and he like runs oh my god he runs away to go get sarah sarah is seeing off Carl at the bus stop and then she drives away they're like oh, okay and like Carl like kisses her or whatever yeah 
Yeah. Like, dude. Beth who? I was, I, I leaned back. I was like, homeboy, your wife has been confirmed dead for about eight hours. Yeah. And you're just like, here, here you go. Right on the lips there. See you later. Everybody grieves differently. I think we say that often <laughs> enough on this show. Um. But like, come the fuck on, man. Some people grieve and other people just kind of wipe their brain like the stepfather. Other people move right on. Yeah. You mean she was just shot out of its body? Okay, that's good enough for me. Wipe the tears away. Well, see ya. No, like like Joe said, he's part of the stepfather program. He just gets reset. Yeah, no, they, he gets that How Do Howard book and his orientation. He's a winter stepfather now. Yep, he fucking just is just like, yep, yeah, well, she's my wife now. But he, his co driven, she's like, she's like, report for animals. <laughs> <laughs> Camera, Razorback. You say it's his wife now, and that kind of lines up with uh, Unlucky Leprechaun, how he just met this woman and they were together by the end of the film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah how to Howard is a winter stepfather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. Well, he writes the books. I mean, he wrote the book. He wrote the book on how to do it. He's the guy at the beginning that fucking, um, that Zemo is like dunking underwater. Housewares, do it yourself. <laughs> Leprechaun. DIY. <laughs> Warwick Davis. <laughs> Longing <laughs> furnace, Ireland. So after we get this heart-wrenching scene of this guy with his dead dogs and his leg just totally fucked, uh, we get another great scene where uh, these Mad Max brothers just run over Spider just for fun. Ugh, I fucking hated it. Yeah, so Spider's like running to go get Sarah, and they just fucking run it over. And then it, one of them was like, why'd you do that? And he's like, I don't know, for fun. <laughs> I did it because I wanted to. And Sarah, as she goes to leave, she sees the dead dog and is like, oh, fuck. And she, she whips the car back around to get Carl, and they speed to Jake's location. Yeah. And this guy is like, dude, he is pushing hard to stay alive. He is crawling through the fucking pig shit and all this stuff to get to this, like, shed, this water shed, or generator shed, rather, this pump shed. Jake is a fucking badass. By the way, this mud pit, I think, is this boar's, like, kill pit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Like, just from all the shit that I keep seeing in it. Like, it reminded me of, um, uh, the Ghost in the Darkness cave they discover, where it's just, like, they were dragging bodies back and just stripping the flesh off of them. Oh, yeah. This is where it goes and fucking bathes in the fucking mud hole and shit or whatever and eats its victims. Yeah, because he, he drags himself... Uh, through the mud, basically scaring off, like, the regular warthogs by, like, just throwing bones and shit at them. And he gets to, like, this generator, and there's, like, this real small runoff that he's just using to get any kind of water in his system and to clean his face off. And, uh, unfortunately for Jake, uh, it's time for him to punch his ticket. It's his Ahab moment. Yeah? Okay, so you guys are never going to believe what's in the uncut version of this scene. Just in the way it was cut on my version, I was like, there's shit missing here. Um, I didn't think anything of it, but I'm, I'm interested to hear. So what happens is... So in the in the regular cut or or in the cut version, uh, the boar goes in and we again like we have that stupid freeze frame thing where that like zooms in and then it like cuts to outside and you just hear the pig like eating him right. Oh yeah, that's what I saw. Yeah, the uncut version. This fucking thing goes inside and bites Jake's fucking head off. What? Whoa. Yeah. It bites his fucking head off. Uh, you know, I, I felt like $2 was a little bit too cheap, and I, I guess it was because I got fucked out of a better movie. <laughs> Dude bites his fucking head right off, and he's, like, squirming around and shit, and then it just, like, spits his head on the ground. Wow. Why was this cut? I don't know. And then, uh, it's on the VHS. It's not on the DVD for whatever reason. Not in the DVD cut, right? The restored cut. So Carl and Sarah pull up, and when they go in to see Jake, you know how they, like, see his body, but they don't you know, actually see it? Right. Yeah. Well, it there's a quick cut where it shows his head just, like, covered in dirt and, like, fucking flies and shit, like, detached from his body. Wow. Oh! So this movie also had a roadside picnic. Oh, yeah, it sure did. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, you know, this is kind of blowing me away a little bit. This hasn't happened too often on this show, but, uh, yeah, I feel like I got kind of... Uh, Cheated. Cheapened out of a better film. It's rare that we come across... I think, like, Guyver was one of the first instances where, like, we saw a cut that I distinctly remember watching a different one when I was younger which had far more graphic violence and like yeah. it's rare that we come across a movie where like an extended almost necessary much more visually pleasing death scene is removed it altogether right I mean I'm, I'm over exaggerating my point a little bit I don't think it's like that huge of a deal but like that scene's kind of like I was surprised it works in the version that I saw but that's way better yeah I was just surprised I was like wow that's significant because everything else is kind of like all right, but, like, that was, like, a significant cut. Sure. Also, P.S., I think the only 
for Guyver specifically, there is the VHS version is uncut, and then the only other uncut version is the German Blu-ray. Yeah. Like even the Arrow Blu-ray is cut for whatever reason. Yeah, which is so bizarre because like I distinctly remember seeing a version of that movie that had like I think it's the warehouse fight scene where right before uh, Sean has his unit ripped out, like he grabs one of those zoonoids by the arms breaks his wrist there's a spray of blood and then i think he blows its head up with its gut with his head laser like it's i remember that and then the version we watched didn't have that shit at all specifically when he cuts the fucking uh the the chick's arm off the like the the wear parrot yeah yeah exactly um yeah they don't show that in that cut so yeah carl sees like on the ground uh in the area like these uh these cuts in the ground and he remembers back to where benny was throwing this cleaver into the ground and he he correlates like oh shit they were either there or you know they didn't help him or something they they were in the area essentially yeah so carl fucking just dr- jumps in the fucking jeep i don't know where sarah goes but he fucking drives oh si- okay so yeah that um this becomes two revenge missions at this movie because yeah carl is going to benny and dicko because one like He's always had, I think he's had suspicion they know what happened to his wife, and two, like... Oh, for sure. Two with Jake. So, and then Sarah goes to rally up the locals, because they're gonna go fucking take on this razor, uh, this Razorback. So, she goes to town to get everybody together, and he goes straight to the scumbag's uh, headquarters. And this is where you find out, at least, this was my read on it, was that the shitter is right there. Because he crashes this car into the fucking front of this, this fucking... <laughs> trash heap and this guy comes out with his pants down his leg like oh, i'm taking a shit yeah so he's got him at gunpoint but somehow this he like he has like a fucking uh like ben gardner's fuck or not ben gardner uh he's got he's got like the fucking hook from i know you did last summer like the ice hook and or the meat hook whatever you want to call it yeah and he fucking like cuts him and he goes and he like runs into the bush so he ends up like hiding in this fucking well, it's a mine shaft. Is it a mine shaft? That's the that's the whole irony of the situation. He initially loses him in this landscape that for me is impossible to describe because uh, Connor, I know how to describe it. You remember when Piccolo fought Doctor Jero in the Android Saga? <laughs> <laughs> just think about what that landscape was. This is what we have. It really is something you'd see in Dragon Ball, like just like this weird fucking wasteland of like, but it's like it's this weird series of very small hills. It's like craters. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, like they're just like two feet apart. So like, if you were to you know go over the horizon running from someone, you could duck behind one of these hills and conceivably not be seen. Lay down in a little bowl. Yeah, and so that's like so Carl gets up and he's essentially, he's essentially like fuck. Like I don't know where he is looking over in this like this ter- this terrain. He could be anywhere. Surprise! He's right there. <laughs> yeah, and, he, and he, Carl also reveals himself to Benny too. He's like, I'm Carl Winners, motherfucker. And he's like, Oh shit! Right? Yeah. Remember Beth Winners? Why'd you say that name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to say Beth. <laughs> the entire movie, everybody's telling this guy that his wife died by falling down a mine shaft. Well, Benny comes out of a mine shaft to attack him. And I, I guess this guy didn't think this through at all because he's like basically like he thinks he gets Carl in the leg, but Carl just like gets immediately back up and grabs like the lever where this guy's hanging on this cord and just lowers it further down. Dude. And he's like, oh, hey, hey, oh, whoa, hang on. Ah, don't drop me in this pit. He's like kicking dirt in his face and shit. He's like, what happened to my wife? And he's like, you were there. And he's like, he's like, ah, oh, we didn't, we were just funning around. And and then the razor back came and he's like, yeah, you were fucking there. And he's like throwing dirt at him and shit. And like for a split second, he's about to fucking pull this winch and just drop his ass, but he doesn't. And he walks away, but the winch gives out anyway, and he just plummets to his fucking death. <laughs> it's fucking awesome. I love that. Yeah, falls down a mine shaft just like Hendrix from Mosquito. No, 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 no! I was ch- <laughs> He gets fucking Hendrix straight up, yeah. Lands down there. Lands in, You know, he lands in those tunnels that P-Head was fucking tromping around in earlier. He lands right on that car table. Yeah, this proverbial table, you know, like we've always said, the mine, you know, all, uh, all holes lead to one place, uh... And it's, it's the card table. All mine shafts lead to one place. I just see him, like, Benny, Benny falls under the card table, and, like, Cumdar just fucking, like, throws his hand down on top of him, and he's like, he's like, yeah, hey, Royal <laughs> Flush or whatever. I fall. Pumpkinhead, like, wins the round and, and just grabs Benny and everything else off the table, like, as his winnings, as his spoils. <laughs> he fucking eats this guy. It just back breaks it all into his knee. <laughs> Pizza, wine, beer, Benny, just broken over the knee. Save that guy for later. Sarah goes back to the pub and get and rallies the posse to shoot this fucking razor back. I 
love this fucking shot. It's great. Of the camera going down the top of the bar through a tunnel of rifles. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and like she's, she's like, and everyone's quiet. They're dead silent except for the tracker ping. And she's like, found it. And they just fucking mobilize. It's awesome. So good. And and the guy that owns the place that lent his car to Carl earlier is like, oh, I don't have a car. And the fucking camel guy oh. runs up and pulls him up on the camel. He's like, okay. It's a great gag because like he's trying to get into everybody's car. And they're like, fuck you. And they're all speeding away. And then he looks off camera and he's like, all right, fuck it. And he gets on the back of the camel and he's like, follow my car. <laughs> for a character without a name, he is he's pretty great. Bartender. Oh, yeah. My big disappointment about this is that, like, you have this army of gunmen who are unfortunately pretty much never seen or heard from again. Dude, it's like, it's a Frankenstein situation without a fucking doubt. Like, they're just there to to, to put some pressure on this uh, Razorback. That's it. Well, they're all about it because what happens is they get out to the spot where the tracker is, and it's not the Razorback. It's just a regular pig, and they're like, oh, you're full of shit fucking stupid bitch and then they go back to the fucking bar and then they just fuck off for the rest of the movie yeah and then meanwhile carl's like going you know having a death match with this thing at the fucking uh pet pack well he goes to the fucking pet pack to find deco first right yeah who's who's dancing and jiving around yeah doesn't he discover the meat grinder first yeah like this big fucking propeller uh thing he goes to the um the cannery place and he's looking for deco and like deco like pushes him and almost he almost falls into the fucking fan from child's play three yeah literally and he's like pushing him in he's trying to like push him in with the sh with a shovel deco's trying to push carlin with a shovel and he like gets up and goes after uh Deco and he they end up he ends up like chasing him outside and then like Carl gets into Deco and Benny's truck and like goes to run him down right and he ends up like coming right up on him and shooting a spotlight in his face and he's like ah, just like a kangaroo eh <laughs> and Carl comes out of the top and he's about to shoot him and he's like ah, fucking shoot me already you shoot me and he like doesn't. And it's like this tense scene, and it pissed me off because I wish he just shot this motherfucker right in his chest. The guy killed your wife. Like, come on. Like, you know it. Yeah, and that, that's my thing. Like, both these guys left your wife for dead. And, like, walking away from the dude in the mine shaft is cool and everything, but it's it's like, I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I wish he would have just, like, I honestly wish he would have just fucking toe cuttered uh, Deco with the car. Like, just ran him over. Yeah, just fucking took him out. Yeah. Instead, we have to have this elongated chase scene with Deco, like, running through the fucking shining, uh, main while this thing chases him. He, yeah, he's running through the fucking Boogans Caves. Yeah. This Razorback comes and, like, scares them, and Deco goes running, and it finally catches up to him and kills him. But, again, this is another cut scene from this film. It's, n like... In this cut, it's not even that satisfying, and even the cut version's not even that satisfying uh, for this scumbag, because, like... In the cut version, you see him run up on him and grab him by the leg and then, like, pull him off screen, and then that's, like, it. Right. In the uncut version, you see his leg full in this fucking thing's mouth and it's like chomping on it for like oh, a cool man. a cool couple seconds. And it like slams him against the wall and then like pulls him away and then all this shit. But it's not that much more than what we see in the in the uh oh, okay. regular cut. Still would have liked to see that. I mean, I would have liked to see his tusk like go through his stomach or something and then like Oh yeah. That would be cool. I mean, fucking Jake got his head bitten off for Christ's yeah. sake. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I didn't see either of these things, so I'm a little disappointed. I don't know. Fucking Deco got killed listening to the fucking whiz on his, uh... Yeah, yeah. On his cassette player. I come on down, he's on down, he's on down the road. On. Razorback's anti-whiz. <laughs> he hates Michael Jackson. You know, maybe you'd have a better chance of survival if you didn't uh, eliminate one of your six senses while listening to the fucking whiz. <laughs> yeah, right. One of the key ones. <laughs> yeah, he, like, put on these fucking headphones. Yeah. Then... Carl goes back to, like, the pet pack, I guess, to try to get away from the Razorback, and just, like... Dude, I guess he doesn't understand, like, the clearance on this vehicle or something. <laughs> the clearance? He hits, like, a catwalk, and this thing just tips to the left and hits the ground. He runs into a bunch of fucking drums, like, steel drums, and then just, like, flips over. Uh, whoops, I, I forgot how to drive for half a second, and it, and it was a big deal. <laughs> I don't usually drive twisted metal vehicles, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm on the wrong side of the road. Whose fucking car is this? Minions? Come on. Oh, man. So he escapes into the cannery, and the fucking thing comes after him, and he and he drops this big metal grate, and uh, or metal sheet uh, door, whatever you want to call it. And it rams the hell out of it. You just see it being indented from his perspective. Yeah, it's cool. And then, like, he climbs up this catwalk, and this fucking thing blows through the window, and it's, like, hunting him around this thing. It's really cool. It's, like, the first... I mean, you've seen it before, but it's, like, one of the first times you really get a good look at this thing. It really is attributed 
related to how this scene is lit, too. Like, the atmosphere in this fucking cannery is so creepy, and it makes the boar extra creepy, like the Razorback. Well, it's like it has a lot of this, uh, you know, fog and dust throughout, and, you know, again, like I, we were talking about earlier, how nasty this place looks to begin with. Yeah. And, like, that Child's Play 3 fan specifically has a very distinct and purposeful... Uh, red light on it. Yeah, and everything else is like blue. A G- giant red light emanating from the inside of it. Yeah. It's very cool. It's stylized, but it like looks great. It, like it doesn't look cheap. Agreed. And Sarah arrives from outside. Well, Carl's up on this fucking catwalk, and he's like throwing glass bottles at this thing. <laughs> right, right. He's looking for the chloroform, like that guy was in the being. <laughs> And then Sarah rolls up, and she's like, where are you, Coral? And he's, he's, and he's like, oh, shit. He's like, get out of here. The fucking boar ends up, like, ramming the catwalk, and it, like, breaks, and he, like, falls down. Oh, man. This was really cool. This 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 gave me a little bit of the, uh, if I had to make any point of comparison to Jaws, this scene a little bit. Yeah, the quint. Where it's like he's like sliding down the catwalk into this thing's mouth, kind of. Yeah, exactly. But I, I really like this scene because... He doesn't get eaten by it, and he gets the fuck back up there, and then this thing's just like, ah, this guy's too much trouble. I'm just gonna go for the yelling woman outside. Oh yeah, the, <laughs> the screaming woman. The boar uh, or the razorback goes after this woman, and then like Carl goes to distract it to like throw it off to get it to come after him. Yeah, and she like disappears into the cannery, and we don't see her again until the end of the movie. I thought. She died, and I was actually really upset. I thought so, too, and they kind of play it up like that. She's screaming, and her screaming just stops. She just stops. Yeah, it just stops, and, like, it trails off. The world. It's like, oh, she's dead. And, like, Carl's like, hey, new wife. <laughs> no, I, now I got to find another one in five minutes. I I, I can't find a new, a new blonde woman this soon. Somebody walks by. Oh, hey, how you doing? Yeah, but then Carl kind of goes into a rage as if she's dead. Right. Well, I think it's really, like, you know, audience members, us included, could be sitting there saying, oh, she might actually be dead, but, you know, no body, no death. So you're kind of like, sure. you could go either way on it. But as far as he's concerned, this thing killed her. Sure. Well, but the way this thing's been displaying its kills in the, in the film, you would think that, oh, well, it's just off screen because that's how we've done the other two, you know? Sure, yeah. But yeah, so he like, <laughs> Carl picks up like a shovel to go after this thing. He's like, come on, motherfucker. I saw Simon Basel do this with a much, <laughs> with a much smaller creature. I think this will do. He fucking hits this thing in the face with a shovel and runs away. This is like whenever the big show, like back in the day, was in a hardcore match and someone like hit him in the face with like one of those trash can lids and he just stood there and was like, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm seven feet tall, you doof. And then fucking Carl does like his best like Lost World uh, trick and he fucking... (laughs) He, he goes to go swing on this fucking pipe and, like, burns his hands and, like, falls off and the fucking thing breaks. You know, he forgot to uh, let the uh, let us know that he had a back uh, he had a background in gymnastics. He forgot to uh, mention that up to this point. <laughs> he was like, oh, damn it, I was never trained for hot bars. Oops. But, impromptu weapon, now it's the host. Oh, yeah, here we go. So, yeah, so the Razorback comes after him and he has this broken pipe, which he jams into this thing's mouth. And I love this because it just keeps coming towards him. As its thing is, like, it lodged in its throat. It's kind of perfect because it's one of those situations where it's like, no matter what you've thrown at this thing, the entire movie, it just keeps coming at you. Oh, yeah. But you're you're finally in such a position that if you don't do something, it's going to kill you. And I love that because that's where you finally get that, that, uh... It doesn't kill it, but it's the most damaging thing that that anyone does to it the entire movie is him just jamming this rebarb into it. Oh, yeah. At two things. So this is also another cut portion of the movie. So he stabs this thing in the neck, and it, like, shoots some blood on the wall. Yeah. And then he, like, gets away. In the uncut version, this thing is spurting blood out of its mouth into his face, like, six times. Oh, my God. Damn. Yeah. And then the other thing is, I think... Don't they kill the crocodile in Rogue the same way? I think so. With like a with like a pipe through the head or some shit. Well, and yeah, I was gonna, I mentioned the host because in the movie the host like no one has any chance of doing any damage to this thing, and then like what is perceived to be the most weak, meager character in the entire film finishes this thing off with a giant piece of fucking rebar in its mouth. Yeah. Yep. Great movie, by the way. God, that movie's so good. It's super satisfying. I love that sequence. I mean, you know, I don't want to go off on a host side tangent. You should just go see it if you haven't. Yeah. But I think the reason why that works, and it's different it's different than this, but at the same time, I get what you mean, Connor. Uh, it was more about the teamwork in that scenario because you had the sister who was like the marksman expert and the, and the brother who's throwing the Molotov cocktails. And yeah, yeah. The dad being uh, the amazing actor that he is. I forget his name, and it's killing me that I'm. it's not coming to me. 
He was in Parasite and a bunch of other movies. Yeah, yeah, he's in Parasite, Snowpiercer, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. Um, he's astounding, and like he murders this thing with tears in his eyes because it killed his daughter. But yeah, no, a hundred percent agree. It's like the end of Terminator One. You know, where, you know, Sarah Connor is just, like, fighting for her fucking life, and she's just doing whatever she can to do a little bit of damage to this thing. It's great. He uh, he gets away from it. Um, you know, in in the version I saw, he didn't get blood spurted all over him like the Exorcist first. But he gets this brilliant idea, and you kind of uh, figure it out with him as he's watching, you know, basically there's a lot of these... Um, it's a conveyor belt. Yeah, conveyor belt. And he and he kind of figures out in his head, okay, if I can get this thing to go in the in the fan blade, yeah. that's that. And, you know, he's, he does this without saying anything. It's all visual. The first thing, though, is the fu- this thing, like, sh- slams itself into, like, this electrical panel and fucking electrocutes <laughs> itself. <laughs> yeah, just to add insult to injury. Yeah. Here's the thing. I thought, because when it, they first, they foreshadowed the fan blade, and then it rammed itself and shocked itself. I'm like, wait, hold on. What's happening? Is, is it going to die from electric? Execution, or is it going to die for the fan blade? I think that's the whole thing. Like, you know, it, you stabbed it in the throat, you electrocuted it, and it still keeps on coming. Time is but a door, death is but a window. <laughs> I'll be back. Death is but a door, time is a window, I will be Razorback. <laughs> oh, uh... Yeah. <laughs> and I think the whole reason it gets electrocuted is just to set all this equipment into overheating. Yeah. I guess the idea is that because all this equipment is overheating due to the uh, electrical box going off, is that this fan is now moving way faster. Faster than it would normally. Yep. Charles Lee Ray's up on a fucking mountain of skulls <laughs> right next to it. Yeah. Trying to fucking put his soul into Tyler. Oh my god, the most annoying character ever. Eh, Tyler deserved it. <laughs> Tyler Tyler deserved to become Charles Lee Ray. Justin Whalen standing there with a revolver ready to fire. This is a stupid fucking kid, I'm sorry. Charles! Yeah. Sorry, Charles. Have you seen Charles? He wants to play hide the soul. <laughs> <laughs> is that what they're calling it now? He wants to play steal my body. <laughs> is that also what they're calling it now? <laughs> Good lord. So Carl's like, come on, motherfucker, smile, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and he fucking like fucks with this boar and it like He might as well have. So it like runs up the fucking conveyor belt and uh he, Carl like jumps onto a pig and like swings out of the way, like that's hanging up in the slaughterhouse. <laughs> and it is like again. Low budget movie, I get it, but this key is fucking bad. Oh yeah, of him swinging while this thing gets like, eviscerated in the fan blade. Yeah, it, and then it just gets he get like fucking right down the garbage disposal. This fucking thing goes. It's cool on paper, and the concept is great. I love the fact that like he beats this giant animal by knocking it into a giant fucking blade of death. But sure, the way it's shot is a little janky, and there's no cut scenes here. Right? So I guess, like, it just didn't look right for the most part. It probably looked a lot better, like, when they were planning it and then when in the execution of Like, I still think it looks really cool. It's just him hanging on that pig looks a little shitty. Yeah. Yeah, and there, there's also a, uh, this, like, weird continuity issue with me where... So the boar is chasing him head on, but when you see it in the fan blades, it is sticking with its head out as if it went in backwards. And I was like, how did that happen? Yeah. Ow. Yeah, no, I didn't think of that. But I'm assuming it's because, like, this boar puppet, this boar effect, was probably like semi-complete for certain shots and maybe complete for others and like what they probably did was take like you know why why destroy uh you know this giant full-size puppet when we have this half of one or we can you know make a cruder smaller version that we can chop up in this fucking prop blade it's also it's probably it's also probably a thing where like well if you put it in head first then you're not gonna hear it's death the, th- the death throws you know what i mean yeah also it's more visually pleasing to see its head go under and be consumed because like you're it's the, the you know the face is how you identify it so you see it get sucked in it's a little more satisfying yeah totally i mean it is an aberration of a creature we don't know it could have been midair went to go grab him and it made a full 180 in the air it's possible or maybe maybe it's ass has a face <laughs> ass without a face <laughs> <laughs> It's its own cat dog? Yeah, it's, I mean, we've never seen the back of this thing. Maybe it does have a big old fucking, you know, it's like that guy with two faces. It could. Either way, it's fucking dead. Yo, it's very fucking dead. Uh, Unless, unless, again, you know, John Hurt is always waiting in the wings for magical creatures to get under his employment. Uh, You know, Carl might have seen that thing get chopped to pieces, but I honestly think it just was sent through a portal and and Hurt sent some ground beef through the other side to fucking throw Carl off his game. Could be. And, uh... He goes into uh, Hertz uh, museum or, or zoo or whatever he uses. <laughs> Hertz menagerie. Hertz got like the fucking the cabin in the woods uh, <laughs> cell blocks. Yeah. I was going to say he's like Professor Oak's fucking house where he's just got them all frolicking around, but that might not work out so well. <laughs> 
That would be a fucking nightmare. Um, oh my god, he puts him in a master ball? Maybe. Yeah. Um, I was just saying, like, Pinhead walks up and, like, arranges its face together on the floor. And, like, <laughs> yeah. like, the end of fucking Pin, like, the end of, uh, of Uncle Frank. Yeah. Jesus wept. So, the old man's boiler is about to explode, so, um... <laughs> <laughs> so Carl runs up there and he fucking Fonzies this thing with a two by four and stops the explosion. Yeah, as he hits it, he goes, "Oh, fudge!" <laughs> but he didn't say fudge. He said the f dash 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 word. <laughs> <laughs> so Carl like is like, "All right, I defeated the pig," and he like is walking out, and then Sarah drops out of seemingly the fucking Hellraiser dimension because she's coated and she's covered in chains. Yeah, what? What is this? Like, it's like a jump scare. And then she's like, and then you're like, oh my God, she's dead. And then like he pulls her out and she's like smiles or some shit. And he's, he's, he's like, oh, she's not dead. Freeze frame. My only theory is that she was running from this thing, got herself caught in chains and got strung up somehow. But then like, what do, what pulley did she run into that then dragged her upwards and wrapped her in chains? Like what was Surter hiding the background I- <laughs> and just like threw her in a cage? Like the only thing I could even think of is that this thing fucking lifted it in the air or lifted her in the air and she went flying into these chains. But even that, I I have no fucking clue. It almost feels like a um uh what's his face from uh Deep Rising, where it's like they were supposed to be dead, and then like they you know after maybe like a single viewing or like reviewing the footage or a test viewing, so I'm like Joey. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, Joey. Like yeah, like that sucks. That person should live. Your fucking Razorback almost cut me in half, man. Yeah, I'm of two minds of this because I'm kind of glad she survived after everything that happened in this movie, but also it just kind of cheapens it because this thing just like totally eviscerates and destroys anything in its path, but this one person gets away because it's convenient for the plot. Not even that. I think it's cheap because like. We, again, like, this guy never really grieves, you know? Like, I wanted him to lose everything. Yeah, you know, he finally found some, you know, not finally, he literally just found somebody else as soon as he found out she was dead. He finally found the woman he's looking looking for. And then at that point, I was like, oh, well, I hope they both die. Uh, You know, I guess he gets his happy ending. Yeah. Uh, You know, Jake's still dead. Uh, He killed those two... uh, poachers and, and it's not gonna have any consequences brought against him but then we f- we fucking freeze frame on carl's face smiling and we cut to credits yeah as they're about to make out and uh probably fuck right in that dirty factory oh yeah so uh so where are we putting this uh shelf that's not with any uh trepidation or anything uh, i don't know why i dragged that like that <laughs> this movie's fun um, I don't think it's perfect right, by any stretch. It's got some weird editing. Got some, uh, like I said in the version we watched, some weird cuts. And like I said, the climax is a little, a little janky looking. But I don't know. Sometimes that doesn't really detract from film's quality. Uh, this movie is kind of uh, bonkers in a weird Australian way. It's kind of like how I said Orca is bonkers in a weird, like Irish, uh, like you know, e- like even British way. Because um, it's a it's a weird interpretation of like a killer animal movie. I wouldn't say this is weird, but certainly fun and kind of surreal. It's not really all that tense. It's just it, it is super interesting though because a wild like a giant fucking killer pig is not an animal you usually associate with like a giant monster animal movie. And it's just got that, like I said, like the Mad Max charm where people are gross and detestable and you kind of can't wait to see them get dismantled. But uh, yeah, Shelf, if I had to put it between two things, I honestly don't know what the fuck I would do there. (laughs) I have no idea where to put this with anything else because I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it before. Yeah, it's it's strange. Um, Shelf for me as well. Um, I love this movie for a few reasons. The first and foremost being it's just gorgeous like some of the shit in this film is just like draw jaw droppingly beautiful like it's very osploitative in where it feels like mad max and like a richard stanley film like like dust devil or like hardware like connor was saying uh or like death warmed up yeah like all of that kind of put together um it's like a fever dream with a giant fucking boar that kills people I love the setting. I love the atmosphere. I think the characters are good. I like the story is interesting enough to keep me invested in them. I hate I kind of hate Carl though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Carl Carl sucks. Carl sucks. <laughs> 
Um, I wish like he, j- I wish like he didn't even come, and it, it, we just, we just like immediately went to like, like I wish, I wish that Beth and Jake got on a little bit more, and then like he was a little, like he witnessed her like die or something like that. Like that would have been more interesting to me. Uh, like he took that personally too. Like he could have saved her or something. Yeah, I would have even taken Sarah as the de facto main character after that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And again, like it's not super bloody. But all of that is made up for in the filmmaking because this is a very, very well-made movie. I wouldn't call it art house, um, but it's definitely like a surrealistic drama horror. Uh, if it's it's a weird it's a weird one to put that under or like how to describe it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's it, I I love it. I think it's great. It's you know it does sag in in, in a couple places, but it's not. Uh, I'm never I'm never bored with it. I guess, and it definitely doesn't feel like Jaws or should even be compared to Jaws. Uh, just to round that fucking base out. And if I if I was gonna put it on the shelf, I would put it between maybe like Grizzly and Orca. I think that's about the size of it because it's like Grizzly is more like this film without the without the like the revenge of the guy or, or like Jake's element in this film is not in Grizzly, but it kind of feels like Grizzly in terms of a giant like a, like a giant animal like a predatory animal uh, in this area, and then for Orca it's kind of the flip where. Orca is the is the, the the sort of hero getting revenge on the animal, which is Nolan. And then this film kind of is right in the center there, where the Razorback is considered the bad guy, and Jake is getting revenge on the Razorback, which he doesn't actually do. But it, for the most of the film, it plays that way. Um, yeah, shelf, love it. Well, the streak is broken. Oh no! Oh fuck! I knew it was coming. This is a dumpster movie. Oh no! Um, I you know. I honestly will put this on the same level as something as The Suckling, which I previously had put on the shelf and still do believe is on the shelf. Really? From a quality standpoint. Really? Yeah, because I think... I'll, I'll tell you why. So I think the titular Razorback is fucking... He, it, it it looks awesome. The, uh, the way they built this creature and portrayed it I think is really well done. Um, the lighting in this film and the cinematography is really good. There's some shots specifically earlier in the film that I love where there's like a windmill going with a huge light behind it that's just creating these, these awesome effects on screen. And, you know, I, I like the character of Jake, and I, I liked Beth quite a bit. I thought she was actually a really engaging uh, heroine. And then you got to pull the psycho angle, and we get stuck with this fucking loser Carl for the rest of the film. And, uh, you know, I, I don't hate this film by any stretch of the imagination. It is like surface level dumpster i just want to get out of the way and say that but do i you know i compare it to the suckling just because that's like probably the movie this year that i probably probably that i liked that i would rate the lowest if that makes any sense like just because i consider it a two-star flick that doesn't mean i hate it sure there's a lot that this movie does well but you know add on the additional shit which i didn't know before recording this so it doesn't really impact my review that much but like the little stuff where they cut out these scenes where the guy's getting his literal head ripped off I uh, would have liked to see that or at least known about it before I spent my, uh, you know, lunch money on uh, the rental. But uh, would I recommend this movie? Hell yeah. You know, check it out. It's uh, it's very weird. Uh, I wish there was less scenes in it that just kind of meander. Like the whole subplot with Carl and Sarah I could do without. Kind of like what Joe was saying. If Jake and maybe even Beth could have been more of a focal point than this, this love... Uh, angle inserted where we don't really need it like like joe even said this guy doesn't even get a chance to grieve he's immediately going over to the next tale of ass as far as i'm concerned because sarah could be a really interesting character like she knows all this shit about computer tracking these animals and their behavior and you know i joke about her being oracle from batman but she's she's portrayed in in a few scenes as this really intelligent person and they don't really do anything with that so Surface level, you know, honestly, it probably gets in there by this Razorback fucking taking a taking a fucking shelf and just, like, eviscerating it. And I use that <laughs> word a lot this episode, but I think it fits. Uh, you know, eviscerating the shelf, and, you know, eating everything on there, and then just, like, crapping out uh, the remains. And this film is getting crapped out to the top of the dumpster. Uh, you know, the VHS tape comes out in a cube, much like it would out of a Wombat's butt. So, you know, figure out the math on that one. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if you want to clean it off and uh, put it back on the shelf, you're going to need a Clorox, but it's doable. Um, 
And, you know, at the end of the day, we really just want to see Steve Irwin diving in the dumpster to get it out for us because uh, that visual has been in my head for like two years now. <laughs> and I uh, haven't been able to bring it up because we haven't really, uh, you know, we did we did aberration, but uh, we, that didn't go hard into the Australian uh, lore, let's say, whereas this film, we got the full out back treatment. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I like the Mad Max vibes. It's kind of funny hearing all those people from Mad Max worked on this film. It kind of uh, makes a whole lot of sense. And, uh, I, you know, I, even though I don't love this film, I would be, you know, I'd probably pick up the Blu-ray. You know, it's, it's, it's at least that worthy, but uh, at the risk of sounding redundant, uh, definitely a dumpster movie. And, CB, if you're listening, dude, you need to do taking a page on Razorback, because I need to know. We all we all deserve to know. Yeah. <laughs> if the book is anything like the movie. I'd li- I wonder if it has a nickname, like, it's not called Razorback, it's called, like... I don't know. Nick. Yeah, right. Well, there you go. It's got a Nick in the uh, the old ear or something like that. Tusk. His name's one Broken Tusk or some shit. <laughs> End of the film is him coming out of a doghouse, people throwing him fucking fish in a newspaper. <laughs> so we just want to thank our patrons uh, for supporting the show and thank everybody at home for supporting it since its inception. But I just want to call out specifically Hunter Davenport, Brendan Lemune, The Autistic Gamer 89, Beyond Hope 777, Christopher, Jacob Chavez, Leonardo Roberto Talavera Barocio. Garlami. <laughs> getting there, I think, on that. Amanda Tweed, Joe Has a Mustache, and Dustin Elkin. Thank you so much. And uh, you can go on that Patreon now, see all kinds of behind-the-scenes stuff involving the barbecue. Barbecue. And uh, some of that stuff we did with CB is on there, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Sign up. Check it out. Let us know what you think. Tell us what you want us to do on it. You know, give suggestions. We're open. Absolutely. And make sure that you enter for our barbecue giveaway. Um, and again, you can reach out to us on any of the social media platforms. Send us a message or send us an email at moviedumpsterpodcast at gmail.com. And all you have to do is give your name and um, write barbecue giveaway. That's it. It's that simple. And uh, keep an eye out because Gramps is going to tell you what's on the menu for the for next week for the uh, next episode. <laughs> Check that MD guide. Listen to Gramps. Uh, yep, it's coming. So that's it. That's Razorback from 1984, directed by Russell McCallie. Hey, everybody, if you want some more bad movie goodness, you can check us out at moviedumpsterpodcast.com. Subscribe to us anywhere you listen to your podcast, and make sure to leave us a five-star review if you dig the show, because it helps us get out of the bottom of the dumpster and into more eardrums. Yeah, and if you're on the social medias, you can follow us at Movie Dumpster on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor McGraw. Thanks for visiting the dumpster. I'm a kangaroo. <laughs> 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 yeah, really good sense for him, I have to say. Who sent me? Come on, man, shoot me! You finished the kangaroo!